party will begin in a moment with the comments of the Rules Committee Chairman, Congressman Joseph Moakley, a Democrat from Massachusetts. Uh, is there any objection to having the, the uh, hearing this morning photographed with still photography and uh, television. television cameras? I think the gentleman from Texas has to be done. Yeah. All right. No objection. It's allowed. <clears throat> committee on the Rules will now come to order. Today, the Rules Committee will continue its hearings on Conres 192, the Hamilton Gratis and Reform Bill. Yesterday, the committee heard from a distinguished list of panelists from outside the Congress, and they're all excellent witnesses. And I see Professor Thurber here today. I'm sorry. Yeah. And if I may, I would like to commend all the members of the Rules Committee, both majority and minority, for their cooperation in keeping yesterday's discussion serious, to the point, and constructive. We had a very good hearing. The issue of how to make Congress better is, without a doubt, a very important matter. It requires that we proceed carefully and sensibly. Today we have a long list of congressional witnesses, including the main authors of the legislation before us, and I want to welcome them, both of you, who, to the Rules Committee and look forward to your testimonies. And given the fact that we have a long list of witnesses, I'll forgo any opening statement. So the, Mr. Gratison and Mr. Hamilton. I understand there's going to be a vote in the Senate very shortly, and that's why the Senate people aren't here. Lee. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We're very pleased that uh, you and your colleagues have uh, seen fit to have hearings yesterday and today on this. Uh, I know you're very familiar with the resolution. Congressman Gratison and I, some time ago, along with Senators Boren and Domenici, uh, introduced this uh, proposal which would require a House-Senate committee to study and recommend reforms in the operations of the Congress and to improve its efficiency and effectiveness. And we hope to try to restore some of the public confidence uh, in this institution. Uh, we think it's necessary for three reasons. First, uh, I'll not elaborate on these. People really do not have a very high opinion of the United States Congress today. They believe it's not well, uh, working very well. Uh, members of Congress, I think, share that view to a very large extent. Polls certainly indicate that uh, Americans are very distressed with the operation of the Congress. We have the lowest public uh, approval rating that we've had for many years. Uh, so people do not have a lot of confidence in the institution, and we want to try to correct that. Uh, secondly, the nature and the complexity of the issues facing the Congress have changed significantly in recent years. Congress has not kept up. We now have an explosion of scientific and technical information coming to us on everything from arms control to environmental protection, telecommunications policy, an increasing array of issues that both cut across both domestic and international lines. They no longer fit the organizational structure of the Congress, and deep-seated problems that require longer-term perspectives. Uh, third, I think it's important because to, to set up this committee, because it's important for any institution, especially an institution as complex as the Congress, uh, just to stand back from time to time and take a look at itself in a systematic way. We haven't done that really since 1970. Uh, previous to that, it was 1946. Uh, I look upon the process of uh, reform in the Congress as a continuing process, an evolving one. 
I'm not sure there's any, I'm quite sure there's not any absolutely set structure that is forever correct for the United States Congress. Uh, the structure of the committee, as you know, would be patterned after the successful reform committees of 1945 and 1965. It would be bipartisan. It would be bicameral, since most of the problems that are to be addressed relate to the institution rather than to just one chamber. Uh, the committee would not have any legislative jurisdictions. Its recommendations would be referred to the appropriate standing committees in the House and the Senate for their consideration, including this one. Uh, as we've moved through the process here, the number of members on the committee have been expanded largely at the request of the leadership, both Republican and Democrats. We now envision a joint committee that would be composed of 28 members. The Speaker and the Minority Leader in the House and the Majority and Minority Leaders in the Senate would each appoint six sitting members of Congress to the committee. The majority and minority leaders in both the House and the Senate would be ex officio voting members of the committee. The emphasis here, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, is on the current members because I think the history of congressional reform committees and commissions suggests that those that have been composed of sitting members are more effective than those made up of private citizens in moving the recommendations through the Congress. You are aware, I'm sure, that there is broad support for this resolution. It's been endorsed now and co-sponsored by 251 uh, co-sponsors in the House, 152 Democrats, 98 Republicans, one Independent. The co-sponsors include 13 chairmen of full or select committees, 55 subcommittee chairmen. The Senate version has 57 co-sponsors. Uh, Speaker Foley, Minority Leader Michael, Senators Mitchell and Dole have all announced their support of it. President Bush has also endorsed it. You heard yesterday from a long list, I understand, of the uh, groups outside the Congress that are going to give us a lot of support and uh, help from academics and foundations, academic institutions. We're very, very appreciative of what they're doing. They're hard at work now. The Library of Congress, through the Congressional Research Service, is writing some 35 briefing papers. Work is already underway at the Center for Congressional and Pres Presidential Studies at American University, the National Association of Public Administrators, the National Conference of State Legislatures, among others. I think it's important to remember that reform in this institution is, is proceeding along several tracks. One track is the bipartisan task force that was recently examined. Uh, for the internal management of the House, that's already well along its way. The second track is the House Democratic Caucus. They're looking at possible changes in House rules, as it does in every Congress, uh, to be considered during the organizing caucus of the next Congress in December. And then this joint committee on the organization of Congress would look at the larger picture of how the institution of the Congress uh, does its job. Uh, there's a long list of items that could be on our agenda. Each of us has our own list. Uh, I'll not try to go into all of those, improving the ability of Congress to focus on the big issues and to think longer term. We ought to look at matters, for example, as GNP budgeting, generational accounting, multi-year budgets uh, that could help us lengthen our policy uh, planning horizons of the Congress. We certainly have to look at committee jurisdictions look at procedural impediments to effective legislative action, approving, improving the ability of the Congress to deal with this uh, scientific and technical information I mentioned a moment ago, improving the interface between the House and the Senate, improving the interface between the institution and the executive branch, and probably as important as any, improving the public understanding of the work of the Congress. For example, uh, the impact of television on this institution and how we can use it to our greater advantage. Uh, let me just conclude by saying that uh, I understand that uh, structural and institutional organizational reform uh, doesn't solve all the problems of the institution. I'm often told that what's necessary is political will, and if you have that political will, you can get the job done. That criticism is, of course, or that observation is, of course, correct. But uh, the Joint Committee is no panacea. We ought not to overestimate the importance of structural reform in the Congress, but we ought not to underestimate it either. Certainly, ineffi certain inefficient procedures and institutional structures can and do block effective action on national issues, as legislation is 
subjected to numerous obstacles and hurdles. Simply putting all of the blame on political will, divided government and the like, is a prescription to do nothing to try to improve the workings of the Congress. It would certainly be nice if there were more political will or no divided government, at least in the view of most of us, but we deal with the situation as it is and we try to make the Congress as responsible as it can be. We all appreciate, I think, that the best way for the Congress to enjoy the public trust is to earn it. And a systematic and thorough review of the operations of Congress can demonstrate that we're serious about improving its effectiveness and, in my judgment, it's overdue. I do not take the view that the Congress of the United States is a mess or is in shambles or is collapsing. I think a lot of effective work is being done, has been done by the Congress, but I do approach this task with the feeling that we can do a lot better and that we can prepare for the challenges and opportunities of the coming uh, decade. I thank the chairman and the members of the committee for their very keen interest and constructive contributions that they have made uh, with respect to this resolution as it has moved uh, thus far in the legislative process. Thank you. Uh, let the record show that Senator David Moore, President. Uh, Mr. Gratison. Well, Mr. Chairman, it's a pleasure once again to appear before the Rules Committee. Uh, I have appeared before this committee, as you know, on numerous occasions in the past, but in my judgment, no issue on which I have previously testified uh, is uh, as significant for the future of the country or more urgent for this institution than the issue before you today. We uh, launched this uh, joint effort last July, well before the current spate of scandals in the House, which obviously have contributed to public dissatisfaction with this institution. Each of the four of us has long been concerned about the pa capacity of Congress as presently organized to deal effectively with the challenges the nation faces. While this proposal emerged from that concern, there is no question that reform of the Congress can also aid in restoring public confidence. We patterned the Joint Committee proposal after the most successful bipartisan and bicameral ref uh, reform efforts of the post-World War II uh, period. By and large, the changes brought about by earlier efforts were positive in that they responded to the needs of the Congress as an institution to deal more effectively with the problems of the times. But it's been nearly 30 years uh, since the House and the Senate have initiated a comprehensive examination of congressional operations uh, and of the relationship between our branch, the first branch of government, and the executive and judicial branches. Frankly, times have changed. The Congress and the nature and complexity of the people's business has also changed. And this resolution is a timely response, not only to perceived problems, but very real problems uh, that exist. Critics of the Congress, and there are many, both inside and outside this institution, claim that there are too many staffers, too many committees, too many subcommittees, too many turf battles. After observing what the Rules Committee had to go through to bring the energy bill to the floor, there may be something to that. Uh, but in any event, I believe that these concerns, as well as other concerns of the membership, including reform of institutional rules and procedures and protection of minority rights, are significant issues in and of themselves and they de that they deserve careful review as part of this process of institutional reform. Beyond questions of efficiency, however, it's clear that procedural and other questions are impeding the consideration by Congress of important national issues. I personally would cite issues like our appallingly low savings rate, dangerously high federal budget deficits, lagging productivity, the capability of many new entrants to the labor force to compete effectively in international markets. Others would choose to address other priorities. But irrespective of the public issue, I think there is growing agreement that short-term thinking, driven by the necessities of electoral and partisan politics, but exacerbated by the structure and procedures of the Congress, is distorting our ability as an institution to address urgent, long-term national problems in a deliberative fashion. Nobody can remove politics from public policy debate, nor is there any desire in this effort to do so. I agree with a comment made by a member of your committee yesterday during the hearing 
that Congress should not and cannot merely serve as a completely efficient processor of law. That's not what we're talking about. While recognizing the diversity of opinion and interest among the states, among regions of our country, among people, between the parties, we can, however, if not remove, at least reduce the institutional impediments that contribute to the gridlock that critics inside and outside of this institution rightly bemoan. Many of the reforms that the Joint Committee may ultimately recommend are not new and have been touched upon already by my colleague uh, from Indiana. Despite the poisonous, and it is, partisan and political mood on Capitol Hill that's been noted not only by outside observers but by many members as well, I think it clear that members of this institution, from the speaker to, com sig to senior committee chairman to members of the freshman class, are increasingly accepting the logic that it would be useful to have a bipartisan, bicameral review of the structure uh, through which we operate. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I am convinced that such a joint committee would be in the best position to consider and make recommendations with regard to comprehensive reform. We should not undertake reform solely for the sake of reform or to try to get the press off our backs or to assuage the understandable popular passion of the moment. The Joint Committee, in my judgment, is the only body capable of undertaking a coherent and integrated reform effort which could effectively assess changes in institutional procedures, including, as already mentioned, the budget process, jurisdictional questions, and strengthening the oversight role of the Congress. Congress is the first, and in my view, and perhaps yours as well, the most important branch of our government. As members and as citizens, all of us, regardless of our party, have a deep and abiding interest in a strong legislative branch capable of addressing the nation's problems. Reform in and of itself is clearly not a panacea. It's no substitute for political will. It will not on its own restore the confidence the public has lost in this institution. Only Congress, by forcefully addressing the nation's problems, can do that. But Congress will only be able to do that if it undertakes the difficult process of institutional reform. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Gratison. The committee, we're very happy to hear from the Senator from Oklahoma, David Barr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you and the members of the committee for scheduling this important hearing and markup on House Concurrent Resolution 192, which would establish a joint committee for oper on the operations of Congress and also for allowing me to testify. As you know, uh, Senator Domenici and I are the original sponsors of a companion piece of legislation that exactly mirrors this on the Senate side. Uh, Senate Concurrent Resolution 57. Our, our Rules Committee has uh, scheduled hearings and action uh, on that piece of uh, legislation, and we currently have uh, 58 co-sponsors on the Senate side, more than half of the Democrats and more than half of the Republicans in the Senate joining us as uh, co-sponsors as well. So I was uh, walking over here this morning, Mr. Chairman, I was thinking back to my earliest memories of these halls. My uh, father served in the House for Ten years, and I grew up spending time here uh, with him. All of us came here because we had such a strong desire to render public service through membership in this institution. And now we all understand that Congress is in trouble. I don't think anyone doubts it. Recent polling data revealed that only one in five Americans has confidence in Congress as an institution. And 65% of those questions said they believe that our elected leaders in Washington are only interested in appearing to solve the nation's biggest problems instead of actually or really working to solve them. This is a heartbreaking breakdown of trust between the institutions of government and the people that we represent, the people who actually are the uh, custodians and the owners of these institutions. This sense of frustration is also very widespread within the walls of Congress itself. Many of our most talented members in both the House and Senate are leaving Congress and they're listing the current gridlock as one of the main reasons for their departure. Many of them believe that their time and their skills could be used more effectively and would achieve more tangible results by working outside the Congress, the body charged with making laws and policy for the entire nation. And I know we've all been struck and impacted as day after day and week after week 
we have seen some of those members who have been inspirations to us, who have been leaders in the policy area, who are right-thinking members, who are among our most devoted and dedicated, deciding to leave this institution, which should be the forum where we're hammering out solutions to the nation's problems. Now that the Cold War of almost five decades has come to an end, the world is entering into a new era where economic strength is at least as important as military strength in determining world leadership. And in such a watershed period, Congress must have the trust of the public in order to make the tough decisions needed for the transition. Now, ironically, now that the need for public confidence is greatest, that confidence seems to be at an all-time low. Mr. Chairman, I believe that restoring that public trust will require Congress to take a hard look at itself. Are we, as an institution, prepared for the demands of a new era? Are we ready and able to lead in transition, to make quick decisions? I believe that many of our own procedures are contributing to the gridlock. Congress has not made a top to bottom examination of its own structure, as my colleagues, as Congressman Hamilton and Gratison, have just indicated for a couple of decades. We have not really had a successful action in terms of major overhaul of the institution since the work of the Monroney La Follette Committee in the mid 1940s, which finally resulted in some major changes and reforms in Congress in 1947. I think it's interesting to note that this also, the most sweeping change and the most effective look at Congress and reorganization of Congress, also occurred at a moment of change. It was the beginning of the Cold War. It was the beginning of a new world era. And so uh, I think that it's a fitting that we do so again. It's another one of those watershed periods. Almost half a century has passed. It's time for us to again look at the institution and to make certain that it's suited to the changing world. The committee's recommendation led to a great streamlining of Congress back in 1947. But since then, we've allowed Congress to become cumbersome and slow once again. The number of committees and subcommittees has grown uh, to over uh, 300 today. Uh, this is especially a problem for us in the Senate, and I know this is frustrating to our House colleagues when we try to meet together uh, to confer. Members of the Senate are now, on the average, members of 13 committees and subcommittees. It becomes almost impossible to devote the time and attention that's necessary for the work of each of these committees. And since 1947, the uh, size of congressional staffs has grown from 2,000 to 12,000. I think all of us uh, realize, realize that having professional staff is necessary. We couldn't work without them, but on the other hand, I think we need to look, take a look at how many and how it's structured. In 1985, the Senate, for example, spent 25% of its time, the equivalent of 45 legislative days and quorum calls and other meaningless uh, procedural actions. And uh, each house has a need to look at its own procedures to streamline our operations. This resolution would allow us to create a committee modeled after the Monomaly La Follette Committee, which had a duration of only one year in which to conduct its study of the institution. So we're not here creating another permanent committee on top of all the rest. Uh, that would stay in action to look at ourselves. It would give us a time deadline to work against in order to make our recommendations. That committee also made great use of volunteer staff, accepting the help of many academic and management experts. Uh, the American Political Science Association undertook to help staff that committee. And uh, we're suggesting that the size of committee staff be kept small and that once again we call on that volunteer spirit, experts in academia and the private sector and management and elsewhere to help us. The history of the Monroney La Follette Committee and other reform efforts has taught us that the only way to achieve real reform is for sitting members, this has been said by my colleagues, to address these problems in a comprehensive manner. Blue ribbon panels of outside citizens just simply can't do our job for us. Piecemeal band-aid changes may address symptoms of bigger problems, but they won't restore the public trust needed for Congress to lead. Mr. Chairman, let me finally say that the reform effort should not be oversold as a cure-all. The best result would be congressional procedures that allow us to focus on the big picture problems facing our country. In the end, there will still be no substitute for political courage as we tackle questions like tax, trade, and health care policy. However, we cannot just say this is the way it's always been when it comes to our own rules and our own structure. As sitting members of Congress, we are the trustees for this institution, and we alone must accept responsibility to put our own house in order and to restore public confidence in this legislative body. Again, I appreciate your leadership. All of the help and suggestions have been given by members of this committee as we've brought this proposal forward, and I appreciate your 
uh, allowing me the time to come appear before you. Mr. Chairman, may I just interrupt for a moment? I, I, I believe my chairman wanted us to keep going, but I, I'd like to say this, if I might. Uh, we're fortunate having, along with some of our own fine members, two very fine members from the Senate over here t testifying, and this member would like to hear his friend, Mr. Domenici. Could we possibly stop for like two minutes to vote, or do you want him to keep going? I, I didn't want to miss his testimony. Okay. The uh, rules committee be uh, recess subject of the call of the chair. It will be an honor, a very privilege to hear from Senator Pete Dominici, Dominici, I'm sorry, from New Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, uh, it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity uh, and to be invited by you to, to, to appear here uh, and, and talk about this joint committee that we're talking about. On July the 31st of 1991, um, Within hours of one another, uh, my two distinguished colleagues from the House of Representatives and Senator Boren and I uh, on the Senate side introduced HCON Res 192 and Senate Con 57. Uh, being ever optimistic, uh, I had great expectations of appearing before the Distinguished Committee last year, uh, thereby assuming that this proposed joint effort could be fully operational by January of 92. Uh, it's a pleasure to be before you now, even though we weren't able to meet the schedule that we, in an optimistic mood, had in mind. This morning, uh, just to make the point, at least for our body, Mr. Chairman, I was late and I apologize. However, literally, I was to be in three committees. Uh, Secretary of Defense was in one, Secretary of Transportation was in the other, and in, in the Energy Committee, one of the largest projects uh, of cleanup on the environment side and energy was before a committee uh, and it involved my state. Obviously I won't do them and obviously I will leave very much to my staff with reference to uh, the issues at hand. So I don't think from our standpoint that I need go any further than to uh, tell you that it is difficult for us to do our work well. So what I'm here for is because I'm interested in finding out if there's a way that we in the Congress can do a better job. That's essentially why I'm enthused and optimistic and encouraged. And I'm even more so when I understand the extreme interest that your committee has taken in this and the opportunity we may have to find out whether we can set in, in motion some reforms that will permit us to do our job better. Uh, many say that uh, what's needed in Congress is guts. Others say we need courage, and others say we need willpower. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, we now have a system that minimizes the opportunity to be courageous, that dis diminishes the opportunity to lead, and wilts the willpower to address tough issues. This system does not let us be what we should and do what we should and be the best. I literally mean that there are senators who sit down and talk about doing something only to find that it is practically impossible to get done. The processes, the multiplicity of jurisdictions, the complexity of our various approaches such as three processes, operational, budget process, appropriations process, authorizing process, befuddles even the most courageous. And I believe wilts the willpower of the strongest. So I joined enthusiastically with those who said, let us ask the Congress if we can attempt to change the inf institution for the better 
not destroying anyone's privileges or even their power, but attempting to change things so that they can do those things even better. This bicameral, bipartisan commission has a real chance to succeed. It may not, but I submit for those who say it may not, the question is whether it's worthwhile trying to make things better. I believe the country cries out with just one answer, yes. Try to change things so we can do our jobs better for them. It has a chance because it should be bipartisan. And I must say to the committee, um, I don't speak for Senator Dole, but I encouraged him and talked him into wholehearted support on his part for this. And I, I must say, uh, we have to keep it bipartisan or it will not work. In fact, on our side, I think it's fair to say, if it's not going to be bipartisan, count us out. The committee itself uh, should have a small staff, and that's what we're telling you. We should use as much outside expertise, uh, and it's there in abundance in this country, and already it works, some of the very best. The time frame should uh, be reasonable, but certainly uh, should not be for any extended period of time. The objective is to help make us more effective, and I think the next thing that makes this potential positive is that uh, this, those four, those three who, uh, who you have already heard from, and I hope I am uh, the equivalent, I think uh, we represent uh, a very high level of commitment to our country and to our institutions, and I believe we have established reputations of uh, very high personal and professional integrity. At least I hope so. Uh, that's one reason that the senators seem to be saying, let's give it a try. The realities uh, of any reform effort have the potential uh, of striking fear into the fearless. However, the House version of this resolution has 251 co-sponsors and the Senate has 57. So regardless of individual agendas, and there may uh, be many, a majority of our colleagues must share our, as primary co-sponsors, commitment to this undertaking with the goal of making Congress more effective and responsive it seems to this senator that if for no other reason than the following, we should set it in motion. The Congress of the United States does not need three processes. It does not need annual appropriations, annual budgeting, and in many cases, annual authorization. It befuddles the mind of our, minds of our citizens as you try to explain this. And I submit part of our problem is we have made our work unintelligible. And when the people can't understand it, they are subjected to, to, their minds are easily subjected to the criticisms that abound in this country and they appear rather truthful to their minds. So I think it's imperative that we streamline this process. And I believe it's precisely the kind of thing that this joint committee can do. We need budgets. We need appropriations, and we need committees that set policy in what we have heretofore called authorization legislation. But clearly, there has to be a better way so that we don't try to do all of them every year, all the time. So I submit to you that uh, we can get some things done. And I also want you to know that from my standpoint, I have no ax to grind, and I have no hidden agenda. What you get is what you see and what you've heard. I will do my very best with others who are on this committee, if we uh, receive your concurrence, to see to it that in a timely manner, we return workable, reasonable reform measures that will make your job as a lead committee in the House more effective and better, but more important that every member of the House and the Senate can day by day feel that they are doing a better job because we have set in motion processes 
that permit them to be the very best they can. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being with you today. Thank you very much, Senator. If the Senators would remain there, uh, Mr. Billinson. Th thanks, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me say, as I'm sure all of our committee members feel, that it's a pleasure to have four such outstanding members of the, of the Congress here testifying to us. We have some other outstanding friends and colleagues coming up soon, and it's especially nice to have, have the, have the uh, presence here of, of two good friends of ours from the Senate who many of us are close to and, and think very highly of. Let me, if I may, play devil's advocate for a moment or two. Uh, yes, of course it would be useful to establish a committee such as this to look at, at reform measures. There are all kinds of obvious reasons to do so. You all have given many of those reasons. If for, no, if, if, if for nothing else, even if we were rolling along quite well, I suppose it's, it's fair to say that every 20 years or so, one should take a look at one's, oneself and see if one can't uh, figure out better ways of, of um, running the place. Yes, of course, it does have broad support from the membership. So does the uh, balanced budget amendment. And in some sense, <coughs> some sense, I don't really mean to compare the two. They're not really analogous. They're both kind of easy ways of dealing with problems. I mean, there'll be much less support for your proposals when you're through with them, I suspect, uh, than there is for the, for the premise that we ought to take a look at these problems and ought to, and ought to send some folks out to, to come back sometime a year or so, hence uh, with um, you know, with, with, as I said, with some suggestions for us, it, it's, it's kind of an easy thing to, to do, for all of us to do at this time, but my worry is, is, is what it will mean. I don't disagree with, with any of the problems or any of the suggestions you all have made with respect to what the problems are uh, that, that we face. My question really is whether you think really that we can reform any of these problems out of existence. I don't really mean out of existence either. I mean, can you, can you reduce them so that uh, certain extent, to such an extent that the things around here would work better and we'll, we'll do a better job around here. And what specifically I want to I ask, if I might, and here are some specific questions to any or all of you. Do any of you have any feel at all uh, specifically as to where we're headed or what you envision or what you think we might come up with? Because when you look at the, when, when you look at the, uh, uh, the words of the resolution, which I, I won't repeat to you, but you know them, they're awfully broad. Uh, they, they allow you to look at an awful lot of things, which is quite correct, but I mean it's a huge undertaking, a huge undertaking. I don't know if you can do it even in a year's time and even, even if you had much larger staff than, than you in, in, envision. But does anybody have anything specific in mind? I mean, we've all been thinking about these things for a while. I'll stop talking in a second, but, and you've been talking to a lot of members as well as yourselves, but for example, if you had to come up a week from now with some suggestions, you might, just, you might be able to come up with as good suggestions a week from now as you'd be able to a year from now. I don't really mean that, but I mean possibly. Uh, you, you may be building, you may be trying over the next year to build a case for some things you already have in your minds, which is fine. But does anybody have any specific ideas right now, for example, as to what we could do to improve this place? So some of us up here at least and elsewhere will get some feel for perhaps where you're headed, where you might come out eventually. Uh, well, let me begin. I, I'm sure that uh, each of my colleagues will have uh, good comments to make in response to that. And I think, of course, you raise, raise the key question first with respect, this, this is the easy thing to do. All of us recognize that what we're proposing here is, is a committee uh, to look at uh, the questions of reform. And I'd be the first to agree that that's the easy part. I think the tough part's down the road here when we begin to try to agree on the recommendations. And it will get tough and it will get controversial down the line. But what impresses me at this point is that there really is a very, very broad sentiment in this institution, as uh, Senator Domenici was saying a moment ago, to tackle these problems, to try to make it do better. Now your question is, uh, what are we going to accomplish? What specific problems are we going to address? Uh, I've been impressed, as I've talked to members about reform, that uh, reform means lots of things to uh, different members. They all have a different idea in their mind of what constitutes reform. And we're going to have to seek for a consensus. I'll try to be very specific with you. I agree with the comment made a moment ago. This uh, complex arrangement of authorization, appropriation, budget committee has got us so tangled up around here that I think very, very few of us understand the budget process uh, in this institution. I would hope, as my colleague uh, Congressman Gratison says often, that we've got to begin to focus on longer term policy issues. So the question becomes, how do you do it? 
one of the proposals that uh, uh, an economist mentions, very uh, familiar to all of us, Herbert Stein, is that we ought to deal with the budget in terms of uh, GNP budgeting, for example, so that you get a sense of what the priorities of the nation are in the budget as a percentage of GNP. That's an idea that attracts me personally. Uh, do others like that idea? I don't know whether they do or not, but I'd like to see it put out there for uh, discussion. Surely there are a lot of procedural impediments to the way this place operates that all of us uh, <coughs> can agree upon. And if I may plug a particular uh, interest of mine, it is uh, improving the public understanding of this institution. Uh, our we, we decided some month, years ago to go to television, but what we do when we televise the proceedings of the Congress is just to throw it to the American people kind of raw, without any interpretation of what goes on. Uh, I think we need to work very hard at improving what the role of the Congress is, and we, we have 20 million visitors a year who come through this Capitol. Uh, we just let them go into the building and walk out of the building without any effort to educate them as to the nature of the institution. Uh, all kinds of interface problems, uh, Mr. Bielenson, between the House and the Senate and the, and the Congress and the, uh, the executive branch. These are things on my mind as I go into this, but the most important point to make would be that I don't have in my mind now five points or ten points that I think we ought to accomplish. Let me interrupt for just one moment, if I may, Mr. Chairman, before the others answer, if they'd care to, just to take you up on one point. Almost everyone has in mind the budget process, and quite properly so, for obvious reasons. Many of us have worked with that, tried to work with it now for a, for a lot of years. I'd only say this with respect to that, Lee, and to my other friends here. Um, this member was appointed by, by our late Chairman Dick Bowling to be chairman of a task force of this particular committee, the Rules Committee, back in 1982 to look at the budget process. We spent two years, about eight of us, with a decent sized staff, which we borrow, we didn't hire any additional staff. It's a, and as I don't need to tell any one of you, it's an enormously difficult and complex issue. Forget about whether or not politically you can make the changes that we probably would all like to make at the end, which is getting rid of some committees or whatever, and that's going to be enormously difficult. But all I'm, all I'm suggesting is that it took us two years of intense study, seminars, meetings almost every week of a small number of us simply to review the budget process and come up with some fairly useful suggestions. And if you all get involved in that, that's going to take up all your time. It may be the most important thing you do, but that's an awfully big thing to subject to, to bite off. Uh, no, but the difficulty of the task and the complexity of the task is not an argument for not trying. I understand. I'm simply, uh, I'm, I'm just engaging in a conversation with yeah. you as to what it is perhaps that you all are going to go off and do if, if we empower you to do so, as clearly we will. One big advantage we're going to have, uh, Tony, is that we're going to have an awful lot of groundwork laid for us during this year with all of the private groups identifying the options for reform and the consequences of those options. And when this committee gets into gear, unlike past reform efforts, we will have in front of us a very solid uh, background work on options uh, for us to look at. And we may, f we may decide that some of them uh, are too much for us to handle. I don't know what we'll decide. But uh, we'll have some advantages that they've not had in the past. It may be that you'll have to handle some of these things seriatim. You know, put all, I mean, make some decisions, come up with yeah. things in the interim, go off to the next, perhaps even suggest that you be renewed for a year or two to, to deal with this, that, and the other thing if, if members are. I think know, there's a lot of, that. I think there's merit in that. Uh, the, the, Do the some good things quickly if you can. Congress is, is an evolving oh, wow. matter. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Congressman Bielenson, again, it's a privilege to be back with you. I uh, valued very much our opportunity to work together when we both were serving as the chairman of the respective intelligence committees in the You're still there, two aren't houses. You? I'm, just for a few more months, I'm going to lay the burdens down very soon. But I, I think, again, going back to what uh, Congressman Hamilton just said, the bottom line is we have to try. This is simply a, it's too urgent a need for the country. Uh, we've had problems in the institution before. But I don't think we've ever had them in terms of a magnitude of the breakdown of trust and confidence of the public in the institution. I don't think we've ever had internal frustration levels as high as they are now. I don't think we've ever been quite as fragmented and polarized as we are now. And so I think uh, whatever the chances for success, we have a strong obligation to undertake the effort. That's number one. Second, when we look back at the uh, 
at the successful pattern of the Monroney La Follette Committee, and that's when Mike Monroney was a member of the House, Senator La Follette was the uh, chair on the Senate side, again was a committee that involved both houses. Uh, many of our problems relate to how we can work together. Uh, I think, you, and it also involves sitting members. It also involved doing its work within a time deadline. And uh, it also involved an, a moment of enormous change in the world. So if there's a silver lining to the cloud that now hangs over us in some ways, and the frustration that we're feeling about what's happened to the institution, it is that sometimes it takes a sense of crisis to get us in a mood to do the things we need to do. And it's interesting to me that the rather comprehensive reforms uh, proposed by the Monroney La Follette Committee were more successful in their implementation than smaller proposals uh, dealing with only a part of congressional reform. In some ways, and it may be ironic to say it, I think you have a better chance if you come with a comprehensive proposal with the public attention focused on the need to reform the institution, with members understanding that we need to make major reforms, and calling for some members to make some sacrifices across the board, if we want to say, instead of just picking on four or five or six or ten members and say, all right, you, you sacrifice a little bit of your jurisdiction. Among the things, in addition to the budget process that, that I think we have to look at, is the committee structure, and I, I think that uh, that's a very difficult one, I know. But uh, we've all been in, attempted to be in conferences with, with each other. I remember one conference I was in, I think there were 13 committees and subcommittees of the House and Senate that had a little piece of that jurisdiction. I thought we were going to have to rent the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles in order to have our conference committee. Well, we know we can't work that way. And it's so helpful when you have committees of parallel jurisdiction where members get to know each other on the House and Senate. They work together within a reasonable number of people to hammer out a solution. So that's something I think that we have to look at that's very difficult. It's a terrible problem on, a, on our side of the, of the building in the sense that we are spread so thin in terms of the number of committees and subcommittees we serve on. I'll give you the example of uh, when we were trying to work out the civil rights compromise on the, on the Senate side. Uh, there were four Democrats and four Republicans appointed to work on that. And uh, to try to sit down and, and revise the bill and get a bill the President would finally sign. Every time we'd sit down to have a meeting, we'd try to schedule an hour to have a meeting. We'd have two or three senators there in the beginning. They'd have to leave to go off to a committee or a subcommittee. You'd have two or three come in in the middle. You'd have two or three different people there at the end. We never had a chance to deliberate on something that Forgive important. me for interrupting, Dave. Can you, can you envision that not being the case even after these reforms? How can you possibly oh, reform I this place that, so that you, I think you solve that, that kind of I problem? I frankly think we need fewer committees and subcommittees. Sure. I think that we there need There will to, be fewer, but you'll still be pulled in two or three or four different directions well, instead of seven or eight or nine. Let me say, or instead you'll, of 13. you'll still have senators getting up and leaving and depending on I'd, staff as you I'd do. Rather, I'd rather be pulled in four or five directions than 13 directions, for example. And I think it makes a difference. And I think that if we can look at the budget process has been said and make a difference, so I think that will be helpful. I think that our, uh, our own uh, bureaucracy has grown uh, uh, too large. That's one of my own feelings. Again, we're all going to have our own ideas about what ought to happen. But I think the important thing is that we begin. And also, that you have a committee, and I think it's very important that members be appointed to this committee, who are willing, really willing to make the commitment to devote a major effort knowing that they're going to have to give up some of the responsibilities and other standing committees, permanent committees on which they serve, to undertake this task for the period of a year. And I hope that our leaders, and I think they will, will look to appoint people who will be willing to give that kind of time and attention to it. And I think the fact that we have a deadline will be a good thing. I tend to think comprehensive reform, doing more rather than less, and doing it sooner rather than later, has a greater chance to succeed because there is a momentum inside the institution and certainly a demand from the public that we act. So I think it's worth the effort and, and I'm rather optimistic, daunting as the task may be, that we'll be able to make some significant changes. Mr. Chairman, I'm taking, in response to my own original questions, of which there were several, we're taking too much time and I apologize to the members of the committee and I won't pursue it now, but maybe other members can can chime in as, as they have a chance to, to respond. Uh, let me just say a couple of quick things and, and then I'll give you back your time, sir, and, and you go on with the other members. We obviously do have an obligation to try to, to, try to reform this place. There obviously has been a, a, a breakdown in trust and confidence and part of a large part of the 
of the public. Uh, I hope, although quite frankly, I doubt that any kind of internal reforms or changes that we make here will do very much to, to change that. I happen to be of the belief that some of you have suggested earlier, although you're putting it a bit to the side now, it used to be the it used to be uh, your key issue, too, with respect to the budget and with respect to some other things that what we need around here is some political will and some political courage. In this member's opinion, what we need is leadership, especially from the top, from a president. I think we're, as we all are aware, we have obvious problems of divided government, which the American people both understand and don't understand. Um, they understand that, I mean, they, they purposely send, I think, to a certain extent, Republican presidents to Washington and Democratic majorities here. Then they get angry with us when we don't uh, accomplish things that we don't agree about things. And I, and I say the following in a, in a, in a very nonpartisan way, and I hope that my friend from upstate New York and others don't get excited about it or any other Republicans in the room. But I'm just, I bet you any amount of money, for example, and I'm just using this as a for instance, if we had a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress or vice versa, and the Congress and the President together were enacting legislation, getting things out, uh, we wouldn't have this perception problem. We wouldn't have even so much of the process problem. If you have the votes around here and the will to get things done, you get them done, no matter how screwed up the process is. That's not an argument against trying to make the process more rational or sensible. We obviously always should do that. But, that's, but reforming the procedure is never going to solve our real problems. As someone yesterday said, the problem is the problem, not the process, not the procedure. So obviously, yes, we're all for this. We all wish you well. Um, but some of us, quite frankly, are, are wondering whether, whether or not we're going to have quite so much of a result from this as we, as, uh, as we would like to have. And I think, fr frankly, the, the big answers are going to have to be found elsewhere. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want, I, with your permission, I would just give a couple of my thoughts in response to the first Bielison question and then perhaps uh, while I have the mic address uh, his last observations. Uh, I, I know that we're going to do make a lot of recommendations that I don't even have in mind at this particular moment. So far be it from me to uh, sit here and tell you that I, I know everything we're going to do. But I would tell you, uh, since you asked for my views, I think uh, we can, uh, in, in the notion of doing the big things in a big way, are more apt to succeed than a lot of little ones. I think we can suggest uh, a way to streamline our three major processes. And I don't think there's any question uh, that between budgeting, appropriation, and their annualization by us, we can recommend that that be fixed. I don't think there's any question about it. Now, if, we are, if you expect that we go into the details of the Budget and Impoundment Act line by line and tell you what parts don't work and what do, I think we make a terrible mistake doing that. But if there's some big ticket items with reference to the budget process and appropriation, I think we can tell you about it. And I'll tell you right now that I think it is silly for us to spend all our time every year on budgeting and appropriating. I have myself taken a look at the appropriations process, Mr. Chairman, and we are duplicating year by year, on average, 90% of the appropriation bills. In other words, about 90% is redone the next year with about 10% on the edges. Pete, you're absolutely, you're absolutely correct, but that's not what's upsetting the public. Well, 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 and it I won't understand. solve our problem. We'll still have, after, with a perfectly rational budget right. process, a $400 billion deficit. All right, let me, let me finish. Now, my goal is to set in motion a process that will let the committees of this Congress look at the problems of this country in an oversight manner. I will tick off a few and tell you uh, that the committees of Congress are missing an absolute bet and are not doing their job. There should be a dramatic oversight hearing on the Superfund of the United States. If anyone wants to become a hero with justice and doing it right, they ought to bring the Superfund of the United States before a committee and find out why, after appropriating some $12 billion, we have probably put about $2 billion in the ground with, with projects. Why don't we do that? Because we rely upon the outside resources, the GAO, inspector generals, and we come here of a year, and right off the bat, what are we thinking about? When will we finish appropriation so we can get the hell out of here? That's about every year's agenda. And what do you have to do before that? You have to pass a budget resolution, and you have to pass 13 bills. And everything else sort of fits in, Mr. Chairman. A little bit of time here in an energy crisis, so you take an energy bill, I honestly believe we ought to have a system that permits chairman and subcommittee chairman to have a 
set in motion some activities that are inconsistent with that preordained format of we come here so we can have a budget and so we can appropriate money. So uh, Senator Bellman once said as he left this place, why don't we do appropriating and budgeting every two years and let the Congress use the other year to look at the problems of the country and the legislation they've already passed and see what's wrong with it. Uh, that's one of my goals. The other one is how do we use our resources? It is incredible how much money we are spending as resources for our two institutions. And I'm not only saying staff-wise, as my distinguished uh, friend from Oklahoma does. We have the GAO. I mean, it is an incredibly large institution. The numbers slipped me, but it's over 5,000 people work for the GAO. The IGs are out there in abundance. We just found out one little agency of the federal government was audited 48 times in one year by the GAO. 48 times. All to give reports somewhere. OTA. Now what I'm suggesting is that this is an information era. I hope we can come up with some suggestions for you all that permit the Congress of the United States to use information better, <clears throat> quicker, and more authentically. I mean, everybody in the world is doing that, and we aren't. So uh, others can talk about committee structure. Uh, clearly that's a terrible problem. Uh, but I don't choose to say that I know how to restructure the committees. I, I think that's a very delicate problem. We ought to look at it, work hard at it. But I, those are some things I think. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, there's a vote on in the uh, Senate. Excuse, excuse me. And I apologize. We've just been told uh, my colleague and I will have to go back over to vote. Uh, I don't know if uh, you need for us to return again or if our House colleagues can respond uh, to the questions that you uh, might Mr. have Chairman, before we I know, I want to just, uh, if, if I could, I know you have to run, but as the ranking member of this committee, I just can't tell you how excited I am to have sat here and heard at least the last part of what the four of you had to say. Uh, you certainly uh, get me so excited because, you know, things are changing. Uh, I will take exception to what my friend Tony Bielitsen said, that, uh, and I think Jimmy Carter would too. Uh, back when he had control of the House and the Senate, uh, he couldn't get things done and the Congress couldn't get things done. We need to change the thing, and you fellows are really going to help us do it, and I commend you for it. Thanks for coming. Mr. Chairman, may I just say Mr. I served under my uh, friend, uh, Senator Domenici, uh, for six years, I think, as chairman of the Budget Committee. It was a great experience. But I also noticed when uh, Ronald Reagan had the Senate, it didn't do any more than Jimmy Carter did. That's so right. Let's, let's get that straight. You're speaking for change. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, whether our hope is whether we have divided government or whether we don't have divided government, none of us can control that. The electorate decides that for us. <laughs> We can do a better job. I think the two comments that have just been made indicate that. Also, we could go back. When Eisenhower was president and you had Rayburn and Johnson here, you had Truman and Vandenberg, even with divided government, things uh, worked much better. And I think part of the problem is that for us to be effective, even in negotiating with the executive branch and hammering out a consensus, we must be better organized. We must be less fragmented. We must be better able to present a consensus to the executive branch as well on the big items. And then we'll begin to see whether we have divided government or not, I think we'll be, begin to see the executive and legislative branches work more effectively together. We are, in a way, hindering ourselves and keeping ourselves, bogging ourselves down in minutia so that we're not the voice on the big policy questions we should be in Congress. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, may I respond briefly to uh, Mr. Gratison? The same question. I do not want to repeat anything that has been touched upon. With regard to the uh, uh, the point that we could spend years on the budget process, it's true, but the fact that your task force spent those two years and the fact that so many outside, uh, able outside folks are working right now on the issues that we're talking about um, leads me to believe that a lot of what we're going to be doing will be re not reinventing the wheel but reviewing studies already made to see what we might have to recommend. And in that sense, uh, I do not think that we are setting up a task that is so large as to be unmanageable. I don't want to repeat with regard to the specifics except to add one point that hasn't been mentioned, and that is the question of minority rights in the House of Representatives. That is a very important issue. This is not the day to debate it. I want you to know that is very much on our minds, and without something meaningful on that, 
along that line, at least from our side of the aisle, there's not going to be support for a package. I guess we all really know that. Um, I do want to uh, talk about two other things very briefly. We're going to have a lot of new members in this body from both parties. As near as I can see, they're pledging four things. First, they won't bounce any checks. Second, they won't use the house gym. Third, they're for change. And fourth, they're for reform. Those of us who have been around a while, and I don't mean to sound like a long, like an old timer, although I guess I am now, we came in together, um, have got to recognize that if we don't find an effective way to channel these energies into ways that will strengthen this institution, just the reverse could happen. And I don't mean that I have a plan. That isn't the point. But I think that the timing of setting this up when we know there is, there's going to be perhaps a, 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 there's going to be a large number of new members, maybe even a record number, I think is, is, is an ideal time to do it. I don't think it's accidental that some of those sweeping changes that took place uh, back in the middle 40s followed very large new classes coming into the House of Representatives in both parties immediately following the Second World War. Final point, in a very real sense, this entire exercise, an effort that we're recommending to you, is meant to develop recommendations for your consideration. It is the Rules Committee that will receive whatever may come out of this process. It'll be the Rules Committee that will decide whether to send nothing forward, part of it forward, or the whole thing forward. And in that respect, uh, uh, while some committees may quake in their boots about the idea, and I know some aren't thrilled to death about the fact that we're talking about this effort, in my view, it will desirably enhance the power of the Rules Committee and its oversight with regard to how to make the overall process work better. And this is very conscious on our part uh, from the very beginning to set this up in a way so that our recommendations come to you and it's in your hands with your leadership, of course, to decide what, if anything, happens to those recommendations after you receive them from the bipartisan, bicameral group. Mr. Solomon. Mr. Chairman, since uh, the two gentlemen may not come back uh, after this vote, uh, might I just uh, say that uh, our Republican leader, Mr. Michael, has been unavoidably detained uh, at a health task force meeting and probably will not be here. And I'd like to ask unanimous consent to Without submit a statement. But Mr. Chairman, if I might also just read at his request just one paragraph of what he had to say in his statement, uh, which says, quote, we need to get a committee established armed and ready to join the issues now. But we must not wait for the committee to complete its work. We must be ready to accept recommendations as soon as they are presented and move them through the legislative process, whether it involves rule changes or new statutes. We must work under extraordinary expedited procedures to get done what needs to be done. And as we heard Senator Boren, uh, whom I have great respect for, the same as I do of you two gentlemen, uh, Senator Boren, just in summation, said we need to do it sooner rather than later. And uh, uh, again, I just look forward to working with you gentlemen. I know uh, uh, you two of, of all the members certainly can, can help us in this, uh, this respect and, and I hope we can accomplish something. We really need to do that. And I thank you and don't mean to hold you up. <clears throat> Mr. Derrick, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry we won't have longer, I guess, before we uh, go down to this vote. I appreciate your uh, uh, willingness to go through this. I served on the Patterson Committee, and uh, Mr. Gratis and I have been here about the same length of time, and it's been my observation that Congress is always looking for some means to come up with to, uh, to, to shield them from the uh, hard decisions. I wish you luck. I think it's something that we have to do for our own credibility, but as far as accomplishing a whole lot, I'll have to say I don't think you will. When I look back over the last few months when the American people took this institution up and shook it and demanded that they do something, uh, 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 as great a crisis in that sense as I have seen uh, since I've been here, and then we just barely were able to get an administrator, which is something that we should have had 50 years ago. We were just barely able to do away with a bank that was antiquated a uh, hundred years ago. And you know, you guys don't have any leverage, and that's your problem. And uh, as long as you don't have leverage, you're not going to bring about these reforms. I can tell you some things I'd like to do. I'd like to cut the uh, committees way down and make uh, every member uh, uh, have one committee. Uh, and, and do away with, uh, with, with the process of, of what is it, the uh, 
what are the things that you leave? So, no, not, well, sequential referral, uh, and as well as absentee voting. Proxy. 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 I'm sorry that I couldn't think of it at the moment. And I also think that it's worth considering uh, abolishing your, your, your three uh, committees that deal with finance, ways and means, appropriations, and budget, putting that all into one uh, ball of wax and bringing it on the floor with priority over everything else except a national emergency and dealing with it. And I think one of our primary problems from a process thing is that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing and vice versa, that we, uh, that we in, a, in a sense, almost when we get to the, to the uh, appropriations process and the ways and means and the budget process, we deal in a vacuum because there, there's no interconnection. If you do this, this is going to happen and so forth. And uh, from a process, and of course, and, and, and I know that that'll never happen, and you know that that'll never happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know I, I think, as I said, we have to do it for our credibility as an institution, but uh, you'll never get any of it done. Mr. Chairman, uh, look, we're not starry-eyed here. We've been in this institution for a while. We're pragmatists. We don't have exaggerated expectations. We just think we have to make the effort. You're not going to revolutionize this place. We, we, we appreciate that. But there isn't a member in this institution that doesn't think this institution can work better than it does today. And our job is to find out what it is that can make the institution work better. You said we don't have any leverage, Mr. Derrick. We have leverage. We've got all kinds of co-sponsors. We've got the support of the President of the United States. We've got the support of every leader in the institution. We've got the frustration that the members of this institution have because it's not working well. And uh, that's quite a bit of leverage. Well, Mr. Allen, that's a lot of leverage. As I, if I may say so, I still go back to my statement that you have no leverage, that Congress is always looking for a way, uh, for some procedural way to avoid uh, the real question, just like the balanced budget amendment that we, that we have coming up here, uh, that I'm going to support. If anybody thinks that that's going to balance the budget, uh, I have a bridge I'd like to sell them. You know, I mean, the budget will only be balanced uh, when the members themselves have the will to do it, and, uh, and I don't see that. Well, it would be wonderful if we had the political will. It would be wonderful if we didn't have any divided government. But that really is starry-eyed at the moment because we don't have either one of those things. Well, I, and know, so I we have to deal with the world as it is, not as the world as we I would like I, it to be. I, I think the idea, and I heard all this, and of course it started with uh, uh, way back in the 1940s uh, about uh, some sort of government with, that wasn't divided. But I, as I recall, when Jimmy Carter was in the White House, uh, things may have been a little bit better, but I don't think he cooperated with the Congress, uh, quite frankly, any more than Reagan and Bush did. They have their own agendas. And, uh, and, and you know, the, just getting two parties in there isn't going to solve the thing. Well, the I mean, I'd love to have a Democratic president, but I don't think that's going to solve the question, or vice versa. Well, you, you and Mr. Bielensen have made strongly the point that we ought not to have uh, exaggerated expectations. I don't think we do. You're absolutely right about that. And I think we, uh, we agree with you on that point. And we ought not to think that this is going to resolve all of our problems here. I think you also agree with us, as you've stated, that uh, maybe we can make some progress and, and we ought to try. Well, I don't want you to think for one minute that I don't appreciate yeah. the effort you're making. And I think for our own credibility as an institution, we must make the effort. Yeah. But uh, I've told you how to feel yeah. about the rest of it. Mr. <laughs> of California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday, uh, Professor Mann, who was here, talked about the view of this institution. He said it's gone from a healthy skepticism to a corrosive cynicism. And uh, it seems to me that while we have a number of members of this institution who are rather cynical, <clears throat> how, how much time do we have left? I'm sorry. I, I forgot. We're pretty close on this yeah. vote, I think. In fact, the uh, uh, gentleman has to vote, too. Why don't we yeah. brief recess, then? Okay. Yeah. Do you want us to come back, Mr. Chairman? Or? You want us yeah, to Mr. Dreyer has got some questions for you. Well, I we'll be happy to come back. Listen, I'd be happy to talk to the two of you on the floor. I'll okay. That. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Your call. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.
touch it on the very short. I mean, you call it. Guess wait just a, a sec. Uh, come on and, and have a seat. And why don't you uh, you start your testimony, and uh, we'll. Uh, I think probably everyone else will be back in just a minute. Gibbons, why don't you proceed? And uh, all right. I regret that I'm the only one here to hear you testify. Well, I understand how that is. Uh, we all are busy. Mr. Chairman, uh, I am a reformer. I have participated in many of the reforms that have taken place around here. I think it's good for us to go back and to re-examine ourselves, both with outside experts and with our own expertise in-house. I love the democratic system. I have uh, made a career of trying to examine government uh, and make government work better here and around the world. But I want to urge this committee in setting up this reform motion to recognize some things that I think are self-evident but we need to recount. One, when we take up this reform, we're going to have 125 to 150 new members in the House of Representatives. And with all due respect to them, they will not have a good concept about what their job is and how you carry out that job. So I think that you don't want to put any tight deadlines in the legislation that will prevent uh, all the members from knowing exactly what's in the reform and the public to generally understand it. I want to say some things about reform that I think will help us all understand what the outcome of this will be. Many members seek reform as a political escape from the political problems they face at home because of the Congress. Reform will not change that, no matter how wonderful the reform is. Legislative bodies, wherever they are in the world, are not held in high regard by the general public, whether they be in the USSR, 
in Great Britain, in Germany, in Japan, in the United States, whether at the city level, the county level, or the state level, or the federal level. That's just the nature of legislative bodies. This is where ideas clash, and people say, oh, we love clashes. They like them on the football field or the ice hockey ring, but they don't uh, like them when they see people disagreeing about things, and we disagree about things, and that's what we're supposed to do. This is a very diverse country, and we have a lot of diverse ideas, and those diverse ideas clash right downstairs on the floor of the House of Representatives, and they're not attractive when they clash. Now, I've been here when the Congress's popularity rating was higher than it is today. That popularity rating rose very high when we did everything that the President asked us to do. And I was one of his ringleaders. And we made more mistakes in those years than we've made in any one year since that time. Uh, because uh, we didn't thoroughly consider the legislation, we didn't thoroughly consider its impact upon the country. And uh, we're still fighting to overcome some of those problems. So you get real popular if you and the President, the Congress and the President agree on everything, pass everything. There won't be the kind of concern, consideration that has to take place. There won't be the kind of perfecting of the legislation that needs to take place to make sure it works well. So. Uh, I think that uh, the role of this committee in considering this legislation should make sure that there is ample time for the consideration of the people who will serve on this reform committee. Two, that there's ample time that the, for people to bring it back to this body and for a thorough understanding, a thorough debate of what is in the proposal and to not expect that unreasonable things from all of the reform movement. I have participated in many of the reform movements. I was a leader with Mr. Connable in one of them in the 70s. Uh, unfortunately, it, you know, it, while it was generally adopted, all the ideas that came from all that reform, uh, the, the, frankly, the ideas didn't pan out as well as we had hoped. And, uh, and I think uh, it, it's because uh, of the nature of it. Now let me say something philosophically about the United States government and about the Congress. The Congress is the most unique legislative body in the world. There is no other body that possesses the responsibility that the United States Congress does. That's because the founders of this country wanted it that way. They gave the United States Congress more responsibility than any other legislative body on earth possesses. And they wanted us elected in a peculiar fashion. They wanted us to represent people from a definite geographic area, and we do. And the fact that we're just going through reapportionment to readjust all those seats points that out even more. Legislative bodies in most other parts of the world do not have that kind of characteristics. One, they do not have the responsibilities that the Congress has under the Constitution. And two, they do not, are not tied down to geographic areas. Some of the people that represent constituencies in other bodies hardly ever see their constituents, don't report to them directly, are not even directly elected by them. Uh, they're elected by all different kinds of processes. So this body is unique. Uh, it fits America because America is a melting pot. America brings together a lot of different cultures, creeds, religions, uh, beliefs, and, and it has been a safety valve. Now, one of the things that the committee that uh, handles this should do is make sure that we get adequate attention from the Senate. One of our big problems around here is the United States Senate. I have to deal with the Senate quite often because I'm a conferee on so many pieces of legislation. And I have lots of bills that get over to the Senate. They've got some games over there they play. Now these are all nice people. I don't impugn their motives at all, but they have no rules over there at all that anybody can understand or find. And every senator is a unique walking 
veto message in himself. One of the games they play over there is holes. You get an important piece of legislation over there and they put holes on it, which means that it never sees the light of day unless that particular senator removes his hold. Now, one of the games that House members have to learn to endure with the Senate is trying to find out who's got the hold on your legislation. And believe me, I have spent hours and months going through the Senate over there trying to find out who's got the hold on the legislation. Uh, you'll go up to a senator, I say, I understand you've got a hold on my legislation. Oh, no, Mr. Gibbons, we haven't got a hold on your legislation. It's Senator so-and-so has got a hold on your legislation. I don't have anything to do. Well, you finally get around to it, Mr. Derrick, and you find out that it's some staffer over in the Senate who's got a hold on your legislation, and his boss doesn't even know about it. Now, I think we've got to insist, as a co-equal branch of the Congress, that the Senate in adopt some rules that are somewhat democratic and, 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 and require comity with us as far as how things are processed in the Senate. That's very important. It is the way the Senate now operates is very undemocratic. Uh, two, uh, yes, the committee jurisdictions can always be revised. We've got too many committees and far too many subcommittees. Uh, it, it, it is time consuming, uh, but uh, be careful. You're tearing up some great expertise when you do that. So all that I've got to say to you is, can be summed up as this. Yes, we need reform. We ought to proceed on this. But you as the Rules Committee should be the ultimate judge of what comes to the floor. And you should give every member, particularly the new ones who will be here next year, plenty of time to begin to understand the significance of what they're voting on. And uh, don't expect too much of all of it. Thank you. Uh Mr. Gibbons, for your very thoughtful comments. Uh, I'll just make a comment and then let Mr. Solomon ask. You know, I think, in, and you were here when I stated what I thought about the possibility of any major reform coming out of this committee. Uh, it's kind of like uh, going to church for business purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that doesn't mean it's bad to do it, but uh, let's recognize uh, why we're doing it. Yes. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, you know, I was here in 19... Or political purposes. Or political purposes, that's right. <laughs> People who live in glass houses, <laughs> something like that. But, uh, you know, I was here in 1975. I was one of the group of the Watergate babies, and uh, we made some significant changes that had been begun before we got here, and we provided the, the uh, necessary votes uh, to bring them about. Uh, as I look back over those changes, maybe there are a few of them that I would bait, but as I look at those changes 18 years later, there are some very definite ones that I think were not good in the long, long, long run. I think it diffused power in this institution substantially and crippled uh, uh, leadership, uh, which uh, I, I don't think was, was good. But the point that I really want to make is that I think if this committee can do anything useful, it will be to provide those new members coming in with some sort of diagram or suggestives or, or at least a multiple choice uh, situation about what they might do because they are going to come here ready to make uh, significant changes. And they better make those changes in the, in the first uh, 60 days after they arrive in Washington because if they don't do it then they'll never make them my class, and I've observed many times, although we are, uh, are voted out three major committee chairmen before we were ever actually uh, sworn into the, uh, the Congress, uh, that, it, that we couldn't have done it 60 days later because this institution, you get to know people and they become human beings instead of just uh, uh, some... I think uh, you uh, really voted out Mr. Pogue because he was one of the first ones considered. I don't know of a harder working chairman than than Bob Pogue, uh, but he happened to chair the Agriculture Committee. He was the first one voted on, and and in <laughs> the speech. in the fury of reform, uh, a hard working, honest, uh, uh, constructive member of Congress got humiliated, 
And I don't well, think we want to do that no, same crazy right. thing again. The, uh, you know, I, on my behalf, uh, and I'm not suggesting to you that I had any more or less wisdom than most of my class, but I, I, I happened to, that was the one fellow that I did not vote against. I mm. voted to, to oust the other two. And, and you know, but uh, it's, uh, they're going to, you know, they, they're going to be some bad decisions made as, as well as the good ones. And uh, in any event, Mr. Solomon, we'd be delighted to have you ask him. Any <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, sorry, Sam, I missed the uh, beginning of your, your presentation. Because I, I didn't miss much? <laughs> no, I, no, I mean, you didn't miss anything. You just started. Yeah. And I have the greatest respect for, for Sam Gibbons. He's one of the, uh, the men who has a great deal of uh, traditional and institutional wisdom around here. But, you know, when, uh, when I hear my good friend Butler Derrick and perhaps Tony Bielenson uh, uh, present a pessimistic image about being able to accomplish anything, I, I just uh, hearken back to when I came to this body. I came here with uh, 30 years of uh, experience in the private sector, and I was a damn successful businessman. And uh, back then, in those 30 years, any time I ran into a pessimist, I ran into a failure. And, you know, if there's anything that's evident today, it is that this Congress is a failure. Now, it has nothing to do with the honesty and integrity and capability of, uh, uh, of the members, because they're all fine, decent human beings. But the, the system just is not working. And, Sam, you mentioned uh, you way back uh, with Barbara Conable, one of the most fine, effective members of this body. Uh, that you worked on reform. Dave Obey worked on reform way back then. And the reason was because there was a need for change. Now, we've gone really 20 years, and times have changed. And sure, the Senate's got their problems, and we've got ours, and uh, sometimes they're similar, and sometimes they're different. We're never going to solve all those problems, but we've got to try. You know, the, the greatest travesty I... <laughs> that I've seen uh, happen in the last several years was this energy bill that came before us uh, this past week. When nine committees brought these bills and they threw it in the laps of this rules committee and they, they asked us to rewrite the whole energy bill. And Sam, you talked about expertise and how important that is and like you have it with trade and nobody has better expertise than you. But here, this, these nine members here rewrote that whole bill and put it together. That is not the way to do business. Uh, I hearken back to the bank bill. The same thing happened, and it ended up a total failure. The budget process, my gosh, is so antiquated that nothing can get done. That was a reform, recent reform. <laughs> that, that, that's right. Uh, uh, all, uh, what, what I'm trying to say, Mr. Solomon, uh -huh. is that when we make these reforms, we ought to realize that they're going to have unanticipated results. That's right. Bad and good. There, there are, there are, you know, I, the, the whole process of setting up the budget committee was, was a good idea. We all flocked to it. Uh, I don't think that anybody ever realized that it would become as complicated as it is. One of the greatest benefits we've gotten out of the budget committee is we've gotten an excellent staff that helps us with a lot of things around here. The, 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 the Budget Committee has, has acquired an excellent staff and a, and a lot of expertise, uh, and we respect them for that. But it does need some changes. Well, it does, and uh, you know, you and uh, serving on the Ways and Means Committee, you serve on that one committee, and that's part of our rule, same as we in this committee can only serve on one committee. Uh, but when you look at the, uh, the entire membership and how they're torn, again, with all these uh, committees and subcommittees, and they really can't do a good job. Uh, you do a good job, and uh, you deal with that one, uh, one subject. Uh, and and but uh, we need to change this whole thing. And that's why when I heard Mr. Bourne and Mr. Domenici and uh, uh, Lee Hamilton, who I served with ten years on the Foreign Affairs Committee, a great member. When I when I see that they are they are so excited about trying to really do something, I just uh, I get excited well, too. One of the things I hope you were here when I was stressing. We as House members need to get some concession out of the Senate about their reform. One, That's they right. should have some written rules that are available to people. Two, they've got to quit acting like a, this crazy system of holes they've got over there that they put on your bills when you get them over there. 
and so that you never know who's got control of it. You can't find it. You can't you can't really reason with them uh, the way they do that. Three. Usually the reason why Congress is late getting its work done is because the United States Senate can't get its act together and get the routine bills done. They're the ones that hold us up all the time. They have never, they have always been the anchor on the ship. And I think that uh, while we are busy reforming ourselves, we ought to put some pressure upon the United States Senate to reform itself. They're not... It is wonderful being a senator. Uh, 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 you are an institution in yourself. And, uh, but uh, sometimes that gets abused. It does, and that's why I'm, uh, I think uh, we're, we're fortunate to be able to have this joint committee made up of the Senate and the Senate. Well, just the, be uh, careful that what the Senate brings back, we just don't <laughs> say, well, you know, we, we're not really interested in your institution. You know, there's a comedy. We, you let us reform ourselves. We let you reform yourself. I want to tell you, I've walked into that trap a number of times. Don't let them get away with that. Let's make sure that they reform themselves, though, that particularly so that we've got a fighting chance to know what they're doing and that they they have some kind of pressure upon themselves to meet the schedules and deadlines that the Congress must have. Most of the time when I go home and I get jumped on by my constituency, I, I have to turn around and say, well, you know, the House has already done its work. That bill has passed the House or has been defeated in the House. It's the Senate that the, 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 the people are complaining about. Doesn't get its work done uh, and, and doesn't really do it as well as they should. Sam, I appreciate your remarks. L let me just uh, say one thing before you go, if I may, and I'm kind of a little bit in the answer to what Mr. Sol Ms. Sol Mr. Solomon said. I think this is a great institution. I think this institution works. I think it is providing the needs of the country. I think it is very representative of the people. And I think it's very unfair to blame the institution for all of this. Because I think if you go back home and you tell your people we're going to reform this institution by changing this rule and that rule and things are going to be different, that you're not being exactly uh, uh, straight with them. You know, there is nothing in our rules that keeps us from balancing the budget. Nothing. There is nothing in our rules that, that keeps us from cutting this program or that program. There is nothing in our rules that keep us, keeps us from passing the kind of energy bill uh, that we want. But we, in a sense, as members of Congress, have become a microcosm of, of the American people in the sense that we want to criticize the institution when we don't pass out the bills that we would like, or we end up in the minority uh, on a situation. It isn't the institution that keeps us from doing this, it's ourselves uh, that keep us from doing it. And I don't care, we can have all the reform that in the world that you want, and the Congress will do what they have the will to do, no more, no less. Mr. Derrick? There have been more than 12,000 Americans that served the United States Congress. Each one of them elected by his own constituency from his own congressional district by a majority of the voters in theirs. And during the 200 years of this, history, of this Congress, the Congress has never been a popular institution. You can go over to the Library of Congress and go through the records over there, the, the cartoons, the, the editorial pieces, and everything else, and read them. They're, they are shocking. You would think that our forefathers were a bunch of scoundrels and everything else, the way they were caricatured and pillared and everything else. That's just the nature of the institution. This is a place where ideas clash. People don't like clashes, but we have to clash in order to, in order to govern 250 million people. That's right. People. And, and, and you know, Sam, I think it has always been that way. It I has. Think, it I, has. I think it has always, in my reading of history, as I'm sure yours and Mr. Solomon's as well, I think the difference today is, and, and, and there is a difference, is that uh, it is because of electronic communication and, and, and things that, that you know, we, we're almost deliberating in every living room or, or on every TV set uh, in this uh, country. And you know, I can uh, make it a, 
decision here or not make a decision and get a call on it before I have a, an, an opportunity to vote. And and I think uh, that, 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 you know, it, it, not, really nothing has changed, but I think people have just become aware of how it's done. And it is, you know, it's it's one of the last great spectator sports, uh, you know, and, 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 and uh, you know, it doesn't always go the way you want to. Anyway, thank you. Do you have anything? Oh, Mr. Solomon, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, We've got to go vote. Right, and thank you so much for your thoughtful testimony. Uh, Mr. Thomas, if you and Mr. Obey will give me just a moment to run downstairs and vote. Delighted to have uh, two of our more distinguished members of Congress uh, before us, uh, Mr. Obie and Mr. Thomas. I, uh, Mr. Obie is from Wisconsin, Mr. Thomas from California. Uh, I know no one that is concerned with the institution. I'm making what you have from you and hear your remarks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to bring a strong dose of skepticism to this hearing today. I think this country is at a profoundly dangerous point in its history. I believe one of the reasons Mr. Perot, who knows about as much about government as Daffy Duck, um, I think one of the reasons that Mr. Perot uh, is doing so well in the polls uh, despite some of his outlandish uh, misunderstandings of basic uh, economic facts, uh, is simply because this country has lost an external threat 
And I think a large segment of the American public thinks, therefore, that they can afford to take a gamble on the presidency without running any real risk to the country. And I think that that's a very profound mistake, but I think that many people hold that view. And I think that uh, not only is the presidency at risk, but I think a good many of our other institutions are peculiarly at risk at this point in our history. I hear a lot of uh, conventional wisdom being expressed in this hearing today, and, and, and I think most of it is baloney. Uh, I hear people say, for instance, that we have to proceed with this in order to reestablish public confidence in their politicians. That is absolute hogwash. The fact is that the public does not uh, public confidence level will not rise or fall <clears throat> uh, in terms of their uh, view of politicians on the basis of what kind of congressional reform we pass. The public's confidence will rise or fall uh, depending upon the kind of job their political leaders do in attacking education, health care, uh, budgets, uh, poverty, uh, crime, a whole list of substantive issues uh, that uh, many people perceive as being uh, uh, out of control at this point. Uh, I also think that there is an incredible desire on the part of a lot of politicians to blame the system because if you blame the system then individuals or groups within the system can escape individual or collective uh, responsibility. And I, uh, I think that we are also plagued by an awful lot of myths. Uh, I mean, what plagues this town more than almost anything else are the things that people know that ain't so. And I would give you just a few examples. Um, we hear talk about how uh, the reforms of the 70s created a huge number of new subcommittees. That was not what they did. Uh, with respect to subcommittees, while, <clears throat> while we have seen some growth in more recent years, the basic reforms in the mid-70s did not appreciably increase the number of subcommittees. They increased the number of individuals who held subcommittee chairmanships because some of the old bulls around here used to hold four and five chairmanships. They handled all the action, while a lot of other people uh, had nothing to do. Uh, another myth uh, that people peddle is that those reforms substantially weakened the hand of the leadership. Didn't do that. If you go back and read Dick Bowling's two books which defined the reform agenda in the 70s, except for that portion that was handled by Phil Burton, which was of a different intellectual stream, you will see that uh, the goal of those reforms was largely to decrease the power of the unaccountable power centers and increase the power of the accountable power center, i.e. the leadership. That's why the appointing power for committees was moved from Ways and Means to the Steering Committee, for instance. That's why the Steering Committee and uh, Steering and Policy Committee was created anew, uh, because they wanted the leadership that was account or the power center that was accountable to be the power center with the real power. And it seems to me that if you want an answer to, uh, to, to, to uh, some of our problems, at least within our own caucus, that it seems to me what needs to be done is that we need to finish the job of moving some additional powers into the hands of the leadership, at least insofar as our own caucus runs. Uh, so that leaders, in fact, have the tools to lead, so that they have some ability to instill in the average member a willingness to uh, uh, agree to fellowship. Because without both, uh, parties don't function in this place. My hero in public life is young Bob LaFollette. I mean, his father, old Bob LaFollette, was the greatest... Uh, uh, politician and the greatest national leader Wisconsin ever produced, but in my view the best legislator that the state of Wisconsin ever produced was, was Bob LaFollette Jr., who was involved in the 46 Reform Act. Uh, crucially, he lost his election to Joe McCarthy 
because he was involved in that Reform Act. And the public thought he was paying more attention to uh, what was going on in Congress than what was happening in, uh, in Wisconsin. But I think that the reason those reforms succeeded and the reasons uh, that, that the reforms that people are envisioning here may very well not is because you had a very different emotional condition present in the Congress at that time. Do you want us to stop or continue? No, no, you continue. Uh, want you to stop. Okay. Take the gavel. Don't take the gavel. Um. <laughs> I'm in charge here. <laughs> I think. Yes, Jim. I think. I think there is a poisonous atmosphere in the Congress today that makes this a peculiarly, a peculiarly bad time to proceed with uh, this effort. And let me explain what I mean. And I don't mean to offend anyone, but I'm going to be very frank. When I came to Congress, well, one of the things... false alarm. I would not <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> when I came to the Congress, one of the things. All right. When I first came here in 1969, one of the things that profoundly disturbed me was the amount of hatred that I saw in the House toward members of other philosophies or other parties. And I think most of that hatred was centered in my own caucus in those days. It was a small number of people who were so embittered by the Vietnam War that they didn't just disagree with Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon and the political uh, majority at that time. They hated it. And you had intense personal uh, venom, which uh, was, I think, making the place a, a very sour place to do business. Jim Symington and I, who were then freshmen, used to talk about it. Today, I think uh, uh, you have a lot of that same hatred, but I think instead of being located in our caucus today, I think with all due respect, it's located in yours on the part of a very few members who, uh, who, who uh, I think uh, are so zealous in their pursuit of specific political or ideological goals that they are willing to burn down the entire institution in order to, quote, save it a la a famous Vietnam general some time ago. And I think in addition to that, we are plagued by a small number of intensely self-seeking corner cutters who will take any issue and use it to attack the institution as a whole rather than to attack specific problems within the institution. And into that maelstrom, we're going to bring a very large number of new members. And those members are going to come here with uh, a desire to get something, anything done to demonstrate that they are, quote, on the side of change, end quote. And so I think you have a tremendous tendency in a situation like that for a legislative body to legislate on the basis of title rather than on the basis of fact and substance and detail. And um, uh, I think that uh, we, I won't say that you should not approve this resolution, but I will say this, that if you are going to approve it, I think that you ought to first assure yourselves that you really believe that you have the kind of conditions present which will lead uh, to some small chance of success. And I would use my own commission on administrative review, uh, review uh, when we were appointed in 76 or whenever it was to deal with congressional reform back in the 70s. I had great, great hopes for that commission. It was members of Congress plus external members. John Rhodes, who was the Republican Florida leader, came up to me and he said, Dave, I know you have high hopes, 
but you just have to understand the practical facts of life. He said, you have to understand that even if you get Bill Frenzel's vote, and Bill was then the ranking uh, member, he said, that does not mean that you will get a single other vote in our caucus. And so when you go into a situation knowing that you have such a poisonous atmosphere that, um, that you're not likely to have the kind of bipartisanship that was talked about here, um, I think it ought to raise considerable number of flags. Now, I, um, I would like to make some other uh, points. I think the kind of legislator attracted to this cluster of issues, the reform cluster, is a very certain kind of legislator. Uh, and I think that they tend to be uh, very bright. But I think that because of that, they often are willing to develop and impose systems which are pretty much like OSHA rules. The original OSHA rules uh, seemed very simple to the big businesses uh, who insisted that we adopt the old advisory committee standards that were in place when OSHA was passed in 68. And they were understood by the IBMs and the huge giants of this world, but the average small business didn't know what the hell was going on when he read those rules. And I think that's the case with congressional reform. Uh, reformers tend to uh, be fascinated by complicated intellectual and procedural systems, which absolutely baffle most members who don't spend a lifetime tracking the ins and outs of the budget process, for instance. And so I think you also have to make certain that you really believe that you're going to have a lot of hard-headed skeptics uh, on, uh, on, on this commission, because otherwise we are in danger, I believe, of being, uh, of being uh, neglectful of uh, the rule that I think is the most important when you go into reform, which is the law of unintended consequences. Example, the best testimony that I have seen anywhere on the budget process and why it does not work was given by Lou Fisher before this committee in March, March 21 of 1990. Lou Fisher, I believe, has a better understanding of why the congressional budget process doesn't work than any human being in this town. And I would ask your permission, uh, I'd ask that you consider that I uh, submit this for insertion in the record at this point. I don't know what, if your rules allow that or not. If they do, I'd like to ask your consideration of that. He makes the point that while the Budget Act was created to bring greater accountability to, this, uh, to the system and greater clarity, in fact, it resulted in less accountability because the very fact that we had to pass a budget resolution created an act of political and psychological transference which allowed the presidency, be it Reagan or be it Carter or anybody else, it allowed the presidency to say, well, look, that's a separate budget process going on down there. We're not part of it. And in spite of the fact that no Congress has ever changed any president's budget going back to Harry Truman by more than 3%, the president has been able to get by for, for uh, ever since 74 with issuing an institutional press release. The details didn't have to mesh, and then we were left with the nitty gritty. And so uh, uh, we did not have the presidency at the focus of the process from the beginning. And I think that uh, Dave, we're likely to uh, make more Dave, of those mistakes. Dave, if I don't, I, I'm very interested in what you're saying. We need to cut it to All right. short. All right, let, let, let me just take two minutes to sum up. I think that um, many of the reasons that the House has not been able to perform has been because of uh, peculiar rules of the Senate, which require them to have 60% rule to do almost anything. I think we have some legitimate concerns about lack of parallelism with, uh, with jurisdiction. Um, but um, uh, the thought I would simply leave you with is that I don't think you ought to approve this resolution at this time unless you really do believe that all four caucuses 
have a very heavy preponderance of people who are willing to take a look at institutional questions and use this as a device to improve the institution rather than simply as a device to transfer power to different groups of people. If you don't do that, then I think this thing is going to be doomed before it starts. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Obi. As I said at the beginning of your testimony, I know of no one who has concerned themselves more over the years with process in this House than you have, and I thank you for your excellent testimony. Mr. Thomas, we'd be delighted to hear from you, and we are all kind of running behind. If it's possible to I will make summarize. It, uh, I will make it fairly, okay. relatively brief, Mr. Thank you. I hate to cut you. Cut First you of up. all, in way of background, uh, I, I live the frustrations every day. I'm a member of the Ways and Means Committee, the Budget Committee, and House Administration. I deal with the issues of substance in front of committees and of institution and structure in House Administration. But let me say that we all have a tendency to, to blur history to our own particular needs, and we often look at the Founding Fathers and deify them. Uh, frankly, they were practical politicians. They believed in a fundamental democratic system. And they did what they could, and what they couldn't do, they put off to another day. Also, when we look at the Reorganization Act of 1946, I think we tend to deify it to a certain extent. We don't put it into the context of the politics of the time. Obviously, the pre-World War II Congress was a um, much different body than any of us had managed. Most of the decisions going on are behind closed doors. Many of the members of the institution itself did not know what was going on, and power was held by very few. But what happened was, in uh, the middle of the war, 1942, two issues came up, one of which was passed by uh, the House and then rescinded, having to do uh, with the retirement program for members of the House. And the second one that was passed and stayed passed was the gasoline rationing requirements. That is, members of Congress voted themselves the highest standing for gasoline rationing. It was, if you will, a perks question in the House that focused a lot of public attention on the way in which decisions were being made in Congress and that it wasn't very transparent until the decision was presented. And then after the committee met and voted the structure, the Reorganization Act of 1946, the 80th Congress that came in following the war took the leadership of the Democrats out of both the House and the Senate and replaced it with Republicans for the first time in um, 16 years, uh, the first time since 1931, which had been the greatest period uh, in which one party had controlled uh, Congress up until the current time, which is now 38 years going on 40. The point being that the reorganization that was put into effect was put into effect when there was a significant turnover in Congress, where you didn't have a lot of the ongoing allegiances that would have made it much more difficult to carry out completely. And even then, when you take a look at what was envisioned under the Reorganization Act of 1946, the most glaring failure was the budget process. Uh, the reorganization of committees was successful, but the budget process really wasn't. What am I saying? That obviously you can take a lot of people who have a will to change, but if the timing isn't right, you have an extremely difficult time in making it work. Uh, I am a co-sponsor of uh, this bill. I think it's important to move forward on, but I'm also a healthy skeptic. As I said, I'm involved a lot in institutional administration reform. We've had before us now an attempt to restructure the House along a bipartisan, quote unquote, uh, institutional uh, administrative structure. I think it's interesting to note that in that attempt to create a bipartisan administrator structure, that the majority party was unable to sit on top of some very powerful committee chairmen who were able to rewrite the rule to make sure that if a tie occurred in the bipartisan body that oversaw the administrator, that in the only parliamentary structure I know of, the tie would lose. In any other uh, would move forward, excuse me, would move forward to the full committee. In any other structure, ties lose, including the legislation in front of us on page three, which says no recommendation shall be made by else in every parliamentary body, ties lose. But in our first and most ambitious attempt for institutional reform, the old bulls, as they're commonly called, made sure that you could not lock it up on an 
bipartisan institutional structure, that the partisan structure would prevail even in what was ostensibly a bipartisan structure. Now, from a pure political point of view, it's up to the Democrat caucuses and the Republican conferences to make sure that there is a stronger leadership structure. I think there needs to be. But when you get to the reorganization of committees, it cuts across both institutional and political. I think we have an opportunity, uh, and this is just speculation on my part, to move, if we move rapidly, to some suggested changes in the committee structure. We don't have to completely formalize them or lock them in, but it seems to me that if we were able to look at some models and perhaps get a, a, a reaction from the members prior to the next Congress, we could begin a process that would not be thwarted by some of the newer members. Because I agree completely uh, with the statements that have been made that once the new Congress comes in, one, they will be locked into place in terms of their committee assignments and it will be much more difficult to change. Uh, but two, they also will not uh, have had uh, much experience in the mechanics of what needs to be changed. So you probably have the worst of all possible worlds. People who are locked into the system because of a desire to have an, uh, uh, an attractive uh, committee assignment, but who then may vote for change without a full understanding of why the change needs to take place. So just let me sum up briefly, uh, Mr. Chairman, by saying that the will to change needs to be there, it always does. I think timing uh, is more important than people think in terms of making it happen. And referring back to the Founding Fathers, uh, one of the reasons they were successful is because they came to Philadelphia as representatives of states under the old Articles of Confederation. But they were knowledgeable enough, they were experienced enough to know that the current system didn't work. And when they decided to make changes, not with each state having uh, an absolute veto, but with a supermajority, they were clearly subversive, and they knew they were subversive. And they knew that they were making changes that would not have been approved back home had it been public. It seems to me that if we have some people of goodwill, people who have experience, and people who are willing to commit themselves to change, and the committee offers some structure that we can move fairly quickly, that these subversives of the current system might be able to put in place some committee changes that otherwise will not be able to be brought about in either the atmosphere or uh, the membership uh, of the succeeding Congress. So I would offer at least one suggestion that we try, that we work quickly, and to see if we can put together uh, some suggested changes. And if it doesn't work, then we haven't lost much. But if there are enough people willing to forego the current power structure, to move forward with the change, I think it's worth the effort. I clearly believe that a fundamental change in the budgetary system needs to be uh, taken on much more slowly, much more systematically, and much more thoroughly. We have failed every time we have tried to reorganize the budget process since that fundamental reorganization in 1946. We probably will fail again, but I want to make sure that we fully understand our options. I think as far as committees are concerned, we can certainly make some quick changes. As far as the bipartisan institutional administrator is concerned, we need to go back and revisit that and do it correctly. You did not, if I might say so, do it correctly the first time. It needs to be truly bipartisan. The majority party cannot have a bipartisan committee that when there is a tie, it moves forward to a partisan committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We thank both of you gentlemen very much. We're, you're both outstanding members of this institution, and even more than that, are people who are involved with and care a great deal about the workings of this place, and we appreciate your taking the time to come up and testify to us. David, if I may, a couple of questions. First of all, I apologize for having missed the earlier part of your testimony. I was down there carrying the bill on the budget conference committee. Uh, is this worth doing, do you think, or would it be better if we didn't do it? Or are you just sort of, you know, leery about it, but perhaps, as well, I, I am, hopeful that, that maybe they'll come up with something useful that we can put into effect? I think it would be worth doing if, in fact, uh, you had everybody going into this in a spirit of goodwill with healthy respect for each other in the institution. But I think that the internal cannibalism in this place has reached such high levels. Um, uh, that uh, I am very dubious uh, whether this is uh, a propitious time to, uh, to begin it. A second question to both of you, if I may. Uh, as you may have noticed, if, if you've read the 
the uh, resolution itself, it's, it's really quite broad. Mm -hmm. Vague is, I don't mean to say, I was going to say vague, that's really not the, uh, the correct word, but it is, it is broad, perhaps overly broad. Do you think it would make any, would be useful at all to suggest changes and that um, make it a little more specific or direct it to specific problems or areas, or do you think it's worthwhile leaving it the way it is and letting them cast about and see what they come up with in whatever area they find useful? I think if you're going to look at something, you need to uh, look at the whole. I wouldn't have any limitations, uh, but uh, I, uh, I uh, with one stipulation, I, uh, I, I think that uh, as the majority party, assuming we still are after the election, uh, um, I still think we have an obligation uh, to, uh, to do what needs to be done to enable us uh, to fulfill our responsibilities. So I don't think that this committee ought to be, the, the existence of this committee ought to be used as an excuse to uh, uh, shortcut any efforts that we need to make within our own caucus to change uh, a lot of things, because I have a laundry list of items that I want considered in that caucus. Yeah, I, I also think you should keep it as broad as possible. The key to whether it works or not are the people that are put on the committee. There are going to have to be a number of subsets to examine all of the myriad issues to the degree that your party caucus can make some changes in the rules that move us forward, you wouldn't need to deal with that within that committee structure. To the degree that the institutional administrator is restructured and actually works, you can remove some other subcommittees. So that by keeping it broad, you can move in the direction of what's left that needs to be done. To make a very narrow assignment means they're going to uh, succeed or fail within that narrow structure. And I don't think we can anticipate what is going to be needed in the next Congress or the Congress after. And so I would prefer allowing the people on the committee to shape what the committee does based upon what happens in this institution. Fair enough. One more quick question to either or both of you, and it's not a terribly fair, perhaps not a terribly useful question either, but um, if, for example, you two were both put on this committee, as I would hope that you both would be, um, and you had only a week to come up with, with some ideas or with some, you know, with, with your answers, uh, do you have any idea, uh, you may not have thought about this in that case, you know, in that sense it, it certainly may not be fair, but are there things that we now know or you think you now know that we ought to do around here, uh, which, you know, it might take some more time to flesh out and to, and to come up with substantive uh, answers to, but, but basically you think ought to be done uh, that you would suggest to this, uh, to this uh, committee? I guess I would take just the opposite approach. My concern is that I think, I know that a number of people in, in the academic community have specific access to grind, specific prescriptions which they just cannot wait to try to get plugged into this process. I know because I've talked to enough of them and I've read enough of what they've had to say and I think a lot of what they're talking about is pure bull gravy. And so I would hope that uh, we would have uh, a considerable degree of skepticism and in fact an insistence that if somebody's going to go on that committee they rethink anew every issue rather than grabbing uh, the first old boilerplate uh, piece of academic baloney you can find uh, within the beltway. I, I, I agree with that and let me say that one of the problems around this institution that I find very often is the fact that we simply do not get together as members without some label on us, either Democrat or Republican member of a committee, and, and barnstorm. Uh, ideas are not your right arm. And, and throw out the ideas in a closed door and, and see if they have some merit among people. And I think an intense effort like that is worthwhile. For example, I don't know why we think the world is, is organized the way we've organized committees. I think there are a couple of fundamental committees that are necessary. Perhaps they could even be enlarged to include more members. But perhaps we could have more transient committees formed upon a problem structure. There are a lot of different ways to go at it. But we do not systematically throw them out re-examine them, decide whether they have merit, and move forward or not. Perhaps nothing will come of that exercise, but nothing will come of nothing. And I think we need to do the best we can to put the best people we can in the room and let them interact without all of these hyphenated labels that we place on them. Other than the fact that they're a member of this institution, they have experience and knowledge, and they are committed to making the place work. So you would not agree that we now know what ought to be done? I think there are a number of suggestions that I would like to offer. I don't know that that's what we now know that needs to be done. I'd like to test them. Okay. 
certainly two, area, two areas we know ought to be looked at are the budget process area and the committee jurisdiction area. Those are kind of obvious. And, I agree, but and the problem difficult. with the budget process is that most of the academic solutions that, uh, that are being floated around out there are what I call the goody two-shoes yeah. type of, uh, of reforms, um, uh, which, uh, which are not based on a hard-nosed assessment of what it is that Congress really does best. And so I guess, again, I would urge you to simply review Lou Fisher's statement uh, when he testified uh, uh, before this committee two years ago, because I think he pops a lot of those balloons, and I think that's where you need to start. Yeah, Mr. Sullivan. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, in welcoming these two uh, distinguished witnesses, and uh, mm -hmm. I have great respect for both of them, uh, I'm not going to rehash what we discussed earlier with Senator Bourne and Domenici and, uh, and two very, very distinguished House members, Mr. Lee Hamilton and Mr. Gratison and others. But uh, David, uh, you know, when I hear, hear you say things like the internal cannibalism has reached uh, such proportions that, you know, it's beyond doing anything about or now is not the right time, and you talk about not criticizing the, uh, the, uh, the institution. No, I didn't say that. Well, let me finish, and then you can respond. Well, I, I'll let you finish if you quote me accurately, but I'm not going to. Well, let then you repeat it, okay? An accurate uh, quotation. I wrote down what you said. Well, then write it down correctly. I will. And I did. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. You well, let's you uh, be be polite and uh, you know not interrupt. I'll I, be polite. I listened very you're not carefully to what you had to say, and I assume that you will do the same. Uh, he did mention cannibalism, though. I remember well, that. I wrote down exactly what he said, internal cannibalism. Uh, but uh, forget that. I mean, uh, but this is part of the problem. You know, the academic community sees a problem with, with the institution. Uh, many of the think tanks, both conservative and uh, liberal uh, and indifferent, uh, they see a problem with the institution. Former members of this house have come in here and they see a problem with the institution. It seems like everybody sees a problem with this institution but us. We don't see a problem. Now, you know, there, there is a problem and that's why there are 251 members that are sponsoring this legislation to create this, this committee, uh, including uh, some of the most prominent members uh, uh, in this House, both Republican and Democrat. Uh, uh, your Speaker Foley is a strong supporter of it. Mr. Gephardt, Mr. Michael on our side. And uh, I just, uh, I listened carefully, David, to, to what, what you had to say. And I wrote down all of the recommendations that you made. And uh, your recommendations were solely limited only to enhancing the power, and I wrote this down, of the Democrat caucus. And in other words, that was indicating, now just listen and then you can respond. Just that indicates to me that, that uh, you think that will solve all the problems. And that will not solve all the problems uh, of what is bogged down this body. It, it won't solve the budgetary process. It won't serve, uh, solve the problem we had with the bank bill last year. It certainly won't solve the problem we had with, the, uh, with this bill here, uh, uh, the energy bill. And so I would just like to ask both of you uh, what recommendations you do have. Now we heard the recommendations about the, uh, about the Democrat caucus, and that's all well and good, but do, do either of you see any, any problems uh, that keep this House from, from uh, performing like the American people think they want it to perform? Because evidently they don't believe it is performing, and that's what I think this task force is going to be uh, constituted to do, is to make reforms uh, that is going to make the House work better whether you think it doesn't work at all, or it works somewhat, or, uh, uh, or is perfectly all right. But I'd like to hear the recommendations of, of what you think is wrong with the system the way it is. What I said was that I objected to members who criticize collectively the entire institution rather than attacking specific problems within the institution. I think you ought to attack those problems. I don't think you ought to demagogue the entire institution. That's the distinction I was uh, trying to make. Uh, I'm not aware that I made any recommendations. Uh, 
you said that the recommendations I made would, uh, would simply have increased democratic power. I was talking transform more power into the, the recommendations I was talking about related to power within our caucus. Hmm. They had nothing whatsoever to do with the Republican Party. I understand. So I don't know what it was that you were hearing that would have increased the power of the Democratic Party because I wasn't uh, thinking I didn't or say Democratic Party. I, I just repeated what you had said about uh, uh, enhancing. You said that you had made reforms uh, uh, which had uh, taken some of the power away from Ways and Means and others and put it in the hands of the Democratic uh, Steering and Policy Committee. That was, and, the, that was the power to select committee members. That is hardly the business of, uh, of your party, and I don't think that changing the mechanism by which we appoint our own members either diminishes or increases the, the power of your party in the House. Well, again, the, the kind of testimony we're looking for is to, is to see how we can, we can uh, establish this committee uh, and how we can make recommendations. I yield to the gentleman from yeah, I, California. Yeah, I, I would disagree with my, my friend slightly on that. The rules of the House are set by the Democrat caucus. The majority determines what the rules of the House will be. We recently saw a piece of legislation moved through which restructured the institutional administrative operations. And his party leadership could not, although I met behind closed doors with a number of them to talk about the problem of setting up a committee that on a tie vote would move it to a partisan body. They simply told me that they did not want to or they could not um, move some of the committee chairman who saw this as the proverbial camel's nose under the tent and that they were not going to move forward with this. I think a lot could be done to make this place run better if we had one leadership that was assertive and as Dave said, followship that was willing to follow. That's one of the fundamental problems. Let me say also, there are a lot of people who see a problem with this institution. The problem is they don't all see the same problem. Sure. And I've taken, I, I used to be an academician before I got into this business, and I am constantly amazed at the naivety of people who are supposed to have some expertise on this institution in terms of how it really works, <laughs> rather than how they think it should work. Uh, and there are a, a lot of people out there who have an expertise in this institution they think. I happen to think there is more expertise inside this institution oftentimes for solving the problem than there is outside. It is the problem of bringing people together to effect the change that many people inside the institution admit needs to be made. And really there it is leadership. There it is a commitment to decide what needs to be done and move forward with it. To the degree we come up with a conclusion and have it floated in Time magazine or somehow put to polls to determine whether the American public thinks that that's a fundamental reform uh, is when we abdicate the one thing that many of us who want change really know and that is where the power centers are, where the personality problems are and how you can change it. And again, it takes I think people inside the system who are willing to be quote unquote subversive to make the kinds of changes that should be made. And they need protection, if you let me put it that way. They need protection from leadership to go ahead and, 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 and have it done. And if we wait until the next Congress, when there are more than 100 or 150 new members, and we let them decide after they've gotten their committee decisions and where they're going to sit, I don't think you're going to see the kind of change that will at least match the 1946 reorganization. I thank the two gentlemen. I do too. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, Mr. Mazzoli, I think you're next on our list, and then Mr. Wolf. You're not together, are you? Oh, good. Come on. Thank you. It's easier to hit you when you're sitting together. Well, we're keeping it bipartisan, Jerry. Mr. Ron Mazzoli from Kentucky. Mr. Frank Wolf from Virginia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will, uh, in respect of the fact that you've had a long day and have a, uh, yet a late afternoon, I'll be very brief. Let me just mention something which occurred just a few minutes ago, which illustrates probably the problem that we have. I was going down to make a vote, and I passed on a stairwell a group of young children who had been in the gallery watching our proceedings. And I couldn't help but overhear one young girl was telling her companion, she said, all they do is talk but nobody's listening. And I got very defensive. I didn't 
uh, I wasn't impertinent enough to go up and tell these young people really what that talk was about and how important it is and so forth. But then as I reflected further on my way into the chamber to vote, it, it does, Mr. Chairman, suggest the problems which you and Mr. Solomon and your panel will have on just what to do first with whether or not you should go along with the formation of this committee, which at the end of the day I hope you do, uh, but also what that panel has facing it in really trying to make some uh, structural changes and some improving changes here. Because the truth of the matter is we know why that is not an empty debate. We know exactly why members are not there. We know why some of the members would, if looked at from above, appear to be distracted or simply uh, totally not connected to what's happening on the floor. We realize the number of things that are taking place. but. At the same time, our body operates in full public view. So somehow what we do has to make sense, and I believe the gentleman from New York says it. What we do has to make sense, not just to ourselves, but also to the observing public. And that is a very, very tough challenge. Let me make a couple of uh, very brief remarks, Mr. Chairman. You have two ways, you have two problems. One is philosophical, and you heard from the two gentlemen who preceded us who are some of the more philosophical members of this body and the four who preceded them who are really um, quite cerebral in their approach to these problems of reorganization. But you also have a practical problem having gone through that esoterica just exactly what will that produce. I think it will produce a system which will never be perfect because it isn't meant to be perfect. It after all is organized and run by imperfect people, and so therefore it can't be perfect. And if perfection is the goal, it'll never happen. Um, and I'd use as an example just today talking to some of my friends who are up from Louisville, and I said, if you, if you really wanted to make this place efficient, you could say, well, let us vote with our cards from our offices. I mean, after all, we have TV, we have electronic systems. In fact, better still, let us vote from Kentucky or California. We could be back home and still vote. We know exactly what's happening. You'd probably not, Dave, but, so, but some of us would still, but despite that. The truth is there's some purpose in not allowing that to happen. There's a need for us to be on the floor and visit with our friends and hear some of the scuttlebutt and share ideas so that, again, we can't ask for perfect efficiency or perfect functioning of this body. If we are, we're obviously going to be uh, unhappy. If the suggestions are nibbling around the edges and perfunctory, they'll never go anywhere and they'll never really improve it. If there's going to be anything done, it will have to be, I think, in a sense, uh, quite revolutionary. And I wish our colleagues on that panel well. I will say my last philosophical statement is this. The bulk of the people who are troubled by what's happening in Congress are not so much troubled by the fact that people seem to be debating without anyone listening or because there is this incessant on and on late night sessions. I think they're concerned about the financing structure of campaigns. They're very much concerned about political action committees, very much concerned about uh, special interest influence on the Congress. Now, this is not your bailiwick. It probably would not be the bailiwick of the panel if you decide to form it, Mr. Chairman. But at the end of the day, nothing that we do in this restructuring is going to really solve any of our problems unless we in a coordinated way, restructure the way campaigns are funded, because that, I think, is the essence of the real problem. Let me just make a couple of practical suggestions. Um, I salute um, particularly um, Lee Hamilton and Bill Gratison because their material was on the table even before the storm broke over Capitol Hill a few months ago. Um, uh, on the legislative side reform, I think the idea of biennial budgeting, as we do back in Kentucky, um, is and advocated by Senator Ford, the whip in the Senate, is an idea that ought to be at least examined. I think we ought to examine somehow streamlining, perhaps even consolidating the authorization and the appropriation process. Uh, that's quite revolutionary, but I think that would overcome some of the multiplicity problems which uh, Senator from Oklahoma talked about. I think we need to reduce the number of our committees and the number of the subcommittees, despite what Dave Obie said, which is that the number of committees haven't changed, it's just the personnel who run them have changed. I think we have too many committees. I think we have too many subcommittees. I think we have committees that are too large. You have some committees, banking is maybe 50 people. You can't run committees that big. If you're going to do this thing right, to really get some reasonable efficiency out of an imperfect, inefficient system, that has got to be a part of it. Now that means if you can equalize the stature and the 
power of these committees, then you might be able to encourage members to give up some of the numbers of committees they serve on. Because I think along with the fact that I think we ought to eliminate proxy voting or be, be severely reducing proxy voting, we can't vote by proxy in the House. I don't know why we should vote by proxy in committees except under unusual circumstances. But in order to encourage members to accept fewer committee assignments and therefore be available to, without having to vote by proxy, we're going to have to make their assignments attractive and, and important to them and to their communities. And I, I hope that that can be done. I think we ought to consider limiting the length of members' service on committees and the length of chairs of those committees. I think this Congress would be with an infusion of new blood I don't mean brand new people from outside, but people who have served around for a while, I think we would have movement, we would unlock this thing. We talk about capital gains tax to unlock assets. We ought to unlock the talent on Capitol Hill, which is here in abundance by giving people a chance to serve in different committees. I, I, I love to read about the Renaissance, and in the Renaissance, perhaps the last flowering of humankind, when people were generalists, they were architects and they were painters and sculptors, and writers and composers because they, had the, they were exposed to all those different things. We are now crushed and squeezed into little channels and that's about all we ever do. I'd like to see you all unlock the talent on Capitol Hill and I think it would, it would flower and I think we could have a renaissance just in that form on Capitol Hill. Administrative side reforms, how many times do we, even my friend who lives right across the river, we scream and holler about these late night sessions, unexpected this and that, I think that um, the place could be run more efficiently it, um, it is a problem, but I would think we could experiment with a system of, uh, like the Senate did, three weeks on, one week off, maybe weeks when we work five days and some weeks where we work only three days to give the people a chance to travel. But if you work, you do have votes on Monday, you will have votes on Friday, but you give advance notice of that. And I don't think there's any reason, uh, unless I miss my guess, Mr. Chairman, anything done after 6.30 or 7 o'clock on the floor down below us is really not always as well thought out and careful as we'd like it be. You're tired, you, you, you have the end of a long day, tempers are fraying, your ability to concentrate has moved on. I think we ought to change the franking situation. I, can, I definitely think franking ought not to go into adjacent districts. We ought to make some changes in our so-called services and make sure that if they are necessary that we pay what is, uh, would be considered a going value. But last but not least, I commend you to your task, Mr. Chairman. I think you ought to create the committee, but it has a very tough task ahead of it. Thank you very much, sir. The, before Mr. Chairman, might I? I Absolutely. I, if you would yield, I have to of go course, down sir. to the uh, floor for a few minutes, and I apologize for having you not uh, here, Mr. Wolf. But uh, just, just to respond, uh, don't, don't need to, I don't think. But you know, a Russian observer of the U.S. House some time ago said that uh, no, when uh, somebody gets up to speak, nobody listens. But when he sits down, everybody gets up to disagree. And uh, what you've said is, is, is so true. I'll be back in a few minutes. Yeah. Before we go to Frank Wolf, let me just say very quickly, Ron, I, th I found your remarks very, very helpful and very interesting and thoughtful. Um, and if you're not yourself put on this committee, as I would wish that you would be, but you may not even want to be, uh, in all seriousness, I would, I would hope that you would, that you would forward some of your suggestions to them. I happen to agree very strongly with some of them. Thank you. One specific one I mentioned myself yesterday, which I'm afraid uh, I agree with you, that probably won't even feel is, is within their purview, is the question of campaign finance reform. If you're talking about Getting, getting members around here to be more responsive and more representative of their districts. There's no way in the world, in my opinion, you can do that unless they are freed uh, from the ties of receiving money, accepting money from special interests, of however you might want to define them. Tony, I appreciate your saying that you've been one of my friends and heroes around this place, and I think that's exactly right. I, I think we have to realize that undergirds this whole Capitol Hill situation. And if they can deal with it, fine. If they can't, we have to come back to that topic. Mr. Wolf. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, just along Sorry, that line, yes, if you'd yield, I, I think that uh, the issue of campaign uh, finance reform is very important, and maybe we could, from this Rules Committee, as we establish this joint committee, make a recommendation that uh, that, that committee at least look into it. We've all seemed to have concluded that, that uh, there can be no recommendation on campaign finance reform from this committee, but I think we should... Since everyone has talked about it and everyone is in agreement, I'm not sure all your chaps agree. But I mean, oh, sure. I, I like we all agree that there needs to be some kind of reform of the campaign okay. finance system. After all, the president had a package. Right. Okay. Which good. Good idea. Let's do that, David. Let's uh, let's make thank that. You. Thank you for suggesting it. 
Frank. Wolf. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be very brief. Uh, I might say I have a resolution. We have 70 co-sponsors. I introduced it January 9, 1991. You have, another again. you have another resolution? Yes. Oh, all right. Well, we'll take that up. Well, but let me just tell you, tell you what it is. And again, it was before the House Bank and everything else, January 9, 1991. And that is to put former members of Congress on this panel. Uh, I've written most former members of Congress. Everyone who answered said it's a great idea. Bob Jimo, I believe it will be very hard for Congress to reform itself. I know from my contacts with other former members that many feel as I do and are sadly disenchanted with their beloved institution. I think many of us, many of your ideas are good ones. We like to help. Uh, this is from uh, Dick Eichert. It is high time, uh, past time for reform, and it is my opinion that no group of citizens would be better qualified to serve on the commission and a bipartisan body of members who have served in the House. Marjorie Holt, it is a splendid idea to call on those who have experience in the body and who have no personal stakes. And of course, with this committee back and forth and votes and things like that, uh, Mr. Uh, Tom Railsback said, many of us who have had the privilege of serving, but who have more recently been in the private sector, have had an opportunity to view Congress in a different light. I believe that our past experience coupled with present day observations could be helpful in making some recommendations to improve Congress as an institution. And there were many, many more, and I might say almost every letter raised the same issue that uh, Mr. Mazzoli did, and that is that you did also and Dave did about campaign financing. They all did, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, they all raised it. But I think it would be helpful to have men like Bob Jonmo, Bill Frenzel, uh, Barbara Conable, uh, some people like uh, like that. I also think they would provide a certain balance that existing members would not have because they could watch it from outside and come back in and would be have no willingness or reluctance to speak out and say what they really believe. That's the end of my, uh, my testimony. Well, we thank you for that, Frank, very much. Um, I agree with you in many respects. Uh, at the same time, I mean, they, ob they obviously are in a position where they can sort of from the outside or from the longer perspective or perhaps a wider, even better perspective, <clears throat> give us some points of view on this which we would ourselves not have. It would be helpful that way. They could not, they would not, I, I assume, under your proposal, be voting members of this or would they? Yes, they, they, okay. they would. I'm not talking about... Because the original proposal here, you know, was to have some advisory people on but not to, no, not to give them no, votes. Mine is, mine is different. They would be voting. I, if you were going to ask Bill Frenzel or Bob Jamba to come and spend a year of their yeah. life, you're right. And ask him not to vote. That's I'm fair not enough. talking a majority, but I think you only, have to have some. That's fair enough. And I don't really disagree with you. You know, the one problem one sees is that you, you obviously have to have the support of sitting members as well, because they're the ones who are going to have to Absolutely. sell it to sell it to their colleagues. And we can't have a bunch of folks who've left us here in the lurch when we could use them around here. They <laughs> wandered off to greener pastures, coming back and telling us what to do. You know, because we have to. You know, I'm being a little facetious about that, but we do have to persuade our current colleagues right. or the ones next year to, to go along with whatever it is that this this committee hopefully comes up with. Any questions of the gentleman from Virginia? By the gentleman from California? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me uh, just say that uh, I think that your idea, Frank, is very worthwhile and uh, we ought to consider it. Yesterday, uh, one of our, I'm constantly pushing the button here, and it's not going on. There it goes. 37 tries and I got it on. Uh, <clears throat> the question was raised about the constitutional uh, responsibility uh, which we have uh, under Article One, and uh, Tony just mentioned something that seemed to me might be an amenable compromise. You said that if we were to ask Bill Frenzel and Barbara Conable to spend a year of their lives working on this, they should be entitled to vote on this committee. But as we look at the people who are going to be uh, providing uh, a lot of research to us, Dr. Thurber was here earlier yesterday. We had Norm Ornstein and, and uh, Tom Mann and, and uh, Professor Davidson. And it seems to me that uh, Bill Frenzel, for example, at, uh, at AEI, or he's at Brookings, I guess, Brookings, too, yeah. and, and others who, have, uh, who are former members probably should be in that same capacity. Uh, they are recognized as paramount experts, but one of the points that was made is that the people who actually make the final decision on this should be sitting members of the House. Now, Pat Cadell, and I quoted this on the House floor the other day, uh, said in an interview in the Los Angeles Times that Tom Foley is not going to reform himself. 
And I, I, I recognize your concern there, Frank, but it does seem to me that, that uh, the ultimate decision should be placed in the hands of those who have the constitutional responsibility to address the concerns of this institution. So I. Well, I, I agree to a certain extent, and obviously the majority would be city members, but uh, the bowling committee basically failed. Uh, the OB commission basically failed. The Patterson commission basically failed. I remember when the, the, the bowling commission came up with a recommendation to abolish the House Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee. Uh, Mrs. Sullivan was the chairman, I think, from uh, St. Louis. They didn't want to take away a committee chair. Uh, she had believed the first woman to have that, and so that everything came in and it just collapsed. So unless you had a, a carnival and a gymo and a frenzel or whoever you think appropriate to say, listen, we went through this before, we did it here, and I think here's what you ought to do. I'm afraid that, that the body would again begin to compromise so much that not much, I, I agree with everything that Ron has always said. Yeah. I don't think that you're going to get a majority of members to do what Ron said, and I like the OB Commission did have uh, public members on who were who were not members of Congress um, on that commission. So I don't the know if the Bowling Commission did did, yeah, did not. I guess the well, commission. it's your decision. I right. think they have some former members right. who have. I think it's a good point. I, I mean, it is something that we ought to seriously consider. I, I, I think Ron that you had some excellent uh, points and. Uh, Boy, I, I do believe that the concept of unleashing the capital on Capitol Hill is something that has a great deal of appeal. How do you all respond to the idea of having members serve on one committee? I mean, the things that have been thrown out in the last uh, uh, 36 hours in this room are incredible. Butler Derrick has said that we should eliminate the Ways and Means Appropriations and Budget Committees. <laughs> we were reminded that up until 19, 1860, that there were not Ways and Means and Appropriations Committees. They were one committee at that point. Uh, and um, the budget was $12 million a year. Yeah, yeah $12 million a year, right, right. And uh, there are a, a lot of very innovative proposals that have been thrown out. The point that I've been making is that we have before us a very unique window. Most everyone has concluded that we are going to have the largest number of new members of the House and Senate in recent history. 118 came in in 1949 following the 48 election. Some are predicting we'll have as many as 150 plus in the House and Senate. In light of that, it would seem to me that we have an opportunity now to possibly reduce the size of committees. The chairman of Appropriations and Ways and Means have both indicated that they want to bring about uh, a reduction in the size of their committees. And uh, one of the points made by one of our witnesses yesterday is that that if a member ends up on a politically unattractive committee, uh, they unfortunately are, are faced with uh, problems at home electorally, and they need to have this wide range of, of options there. But when we had uh, Pete Domenici here this morning talking about the fact that he had three important subcommittee hearings taking place as he sat, sat here. here. Department of Defense had Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Transportation, <laughs> something on a project in his state right. that was of concern. Um, it, it does seem to me that we, we do have to bring about a reduction. And the reason I, I say now may be the time is that when we get this 150 new members uh, in this place, they're not going to be used to having five or six subcommittees on which they serve. So we're, we're looking towards a, an interim report due by the 30th of October, for example. And it would seem to me that this might be a good opportunity for us to make that. And I wonder if Let you could respond to that. Let me just have just a sure couple of, of moments, David, and, um, and then it certainly yield to whatever else. One is I think this is a particularly propitious time in congressional history for us to do something. I believe we have a willing audience both here on Capitol Hill and all throughout the country. I really think they're looking for some fundamental change, and I think we have a mandate to make that change. So I think there's a confluence of events and people that I think could lead to some real change. Secondly, I look on the wall, somewhere is a picture here of Shirley Chisholm, I think, who was a member of the Rules Committee at one time. Mm -hmm. I remember when Shirley made a big battle to be on the Agriculture Committee, and I've, if I'm not mistaken, there she is, and she was from the city of New York, and I said, what is a New Yorker wanting to go on Agriculture? Shirley was prescient. She knew that that was going to be a very important committee for the urban dwellers. Phil Burton, you're, you're from, from your home state, knew that same thing. To get down to it, I think there's not such a thing as a politically unpopular or difficult committee if you give it the proper sweep, which 
in my comments I said if you kind of reorganize the committees and make them all reasonably at parity or give them attractive jurisdictions, and I think you can do it, then I believe you have an opportunity of putting these hundred and some new people on a single committee, give them at best two subcommittees or, or maybe three, and then you won't have the Pete Domenici problem of having to stiff mm -hmm. all of the secretaries in town in order to get to your daily business. This idea of, of rotation, uh, you know, utilizing the capital which is there and, and unleash it and all, something that would be of particular interest, and I think of Tony uh, as an example. We, uh, on the Intelligence Committee, uh, I remember the battle that took place over the succession there and those changes, and I'd be concerned that the problem that we had uh, not too long ago in that area might take place on the different committees, and I, uh, that's something that we would need to address, but boy, I do I, I, I do feel strongly well, you know, that the David, chance you to... know what happens, and, and I use this term, fiefdoms are created in oh. Capitol Hill. And I mean, they we have, sure they see become, it from over here. They become huh? kingdoms rather than even fiefdoms. And I think that one way to get people energized around here, you can avoid term limitations. You don't have to have term limits. I mean, you, you obviate the need for term limits by having a chance for people to serve in different committees and be useful in different ways to their constituencies. So I, I think it has, it's difficult politically, very prickly. Don't get me wrong. But I think it's something that you all could look at. Well, you know, we always joke freshmen despise the seniority system but rapidly gain an appreciation <laughs> for it the longer that they serve. And, and uh, it does seem to me that there is a uh, uh, we should take advantage of the tremendous talent that we have in this institution and allow some of these people to uh, to chair some of the committees. And with all due respect to the great staffs, I, mean, I think that we might have some kind of turnover in staffing and uh, bring some new blood in all the way down the line. What thoughts do you have, uh, about, except for on the Rules Committee, I should say, well, we don't want any of the staff members. We realize the there are certain exemptions over. that you have to build in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it does seem to me that, that we have uh, a tough, tough job ahead of us, and trying to assuage the concerns of everyone will be impossible. But uh, I, I think that uh, it is a responsibility that we have. and. Uh, I know I appreciate all your work on it. I wish you well, you. all of you, too. Good job. Thank you very much. Tony, thank you. <clears throat> yes, our next, Frank our next witness is John Boehner from Ohio. John, why don't you come up? You'll take less than 10 minutes, won't you? Probably? Yes. yes. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of you, the rest of you have noted your presence. You want to go down and vote? We'll see you again shortly. And we'll keep going, I hope. We may have to take a moment off later. Mr. Boehner, good to well, have Mr. you here, Mr. Bielenson and uh, Mr. Dreyer and, and uh, the members of the committee, I want to thank you, one, for having a hearing on the proposal from our colleagues, Mr. Gaddison and, and Mr. Uh, Hamilton, uh, to set up a committee on institutional reform. I think that uh, today it's clear that, that in America, Congress is viewed as in trouble and uh, certainly in need in, of major repair. Uh, the public is frustrated. Uh, they're angry that Congress uh, they see as inefficient, wasteful, and bloated. And I think you and I understand that the cost to this institution because of divided government. Uh, but even with the fact that we've got divided government uh, putting us in gridlock, the American people see us as ineffective and unresponsive. Uh, and regardless of, even if we set up the Hamilton Gratison mechanism, we, we even make si significant changes, all of that will help. But until we get a more political courage uh, here in this institution, uh, I'm not sure how far down the road we can be in terms of being more effective and being more responsive. But having said that, I think that all of you realize that today Congress is, is, this, has this gigantic structure. I know as a new member uh, who's been here 17 months, uh, it's clear to me that, that you just, we can't get anything accomplished. We can't draw a consensus because of the, the way the, the committee structures are set up Myself, I serve on three committees, nine subcommittees. And if you look at my schedule just this week, uh, you would realize that it's virtually impossible. I mean, I have we were surprised to see you here today. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you yeah, I had four subcommittees going on yesterday morning, uh, you know, all of which were, I thought, somewhat important. Uh, but uh, one where we had to mark up where I had to be. So I think that uh, Congress could do nothing more important today 
considering the frustration that there is in America with this institution, there's nothing more important that we can do than take a serious look at how we're organized. It's really been more than 25 years since there's been a significant uh, change in terms of the structure of this institution and the way we do business. It seems to me that this place needs a top-to-bottom checkup every generation or so at least. And the committee should study every facet of congressional procedure and make recommendations. And in my opinion, uh, reduce the number of staff members, uh, the size and number of the committees, subcommittees, uh, and really the, the complexity with which most legislation ends up coming to the floor. Uh, the gentleman from Kentucky that preceded me, Mr. Mazzoli, I think uh, outlined a broad array of issues that, that I would agree with entirely. Uh, one area that uh, uh, I think that I've already talked about is uh, this number of subcommittees. But uh, we also should talk about the Rules Committee. Now, Mr. Hall yesterday and I had a discussion about the Rules Committee, and I understand the need for a Rules Committee. Uh, but you I also... It, you understand it more if you were in the Senate. <laughs> uh, I understand there's a need to have a Rules Committee to act as the policeman uh, for issues going to the floor. Uh, but, but certainly many of us are, are concerned that over the last 10 years especially, what's happened here in the Rules Committee uh, has gone to the point of literally throttling uh, what is allowed to be considered on the floor, what is allowed to be debated, much less what is allowed to be voted on. Uh, and people talk about democracy in America. Uh, it would, I think, be helpful. We have more democracy uh, here in Congress. And uh, when we talk about more democracy in Congress, unfortunately, we've got to talk about the Rules Committee. Uh, but again, I understand your reason for existence, and I don't think we ought to eliminate it. I'm here for one other reason beyond supporting the fact that we ought to have this committee and we ought to take a serious look. And that is, is that uh, I'm here as one of 48 freshman members uh, of Congress. Uh, last summer, uh, virtually every freshman member of Congress co-sponsored this resolution sponsored by Mr. Gratis and Mr. Hamilton. I think it's very important and would recommend that the committee include at least one freshman member from each side of the aisle. Uh, the reason I say that is that freshman members come here from, from a varied background. Many of us served in state legislatures. Uh, we come here with a cleaner perspective. Uh, we don't have all of the burdens of history and the burdens of practice on our shoulders. I'm not saying that we have all the answers, even though some of us act like we do at times. Uh, we don't. Uh, but I think that that perspective uh, on the committee would be very helpful. So anyway, I think uh, uh, I would express that to you. We've expressed it to Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Gratison and to the leaders, uh, and I would make that recommendation to you. Uh, I believe that, uh, that without some kind of institutional reform, the frustration felt by the American people uh, and the members themselves, uh, is the frustration is going to increase and the confidence in this institution uh, is not uh, going to improve. We've got a great opportunity given the mood here in this institution and the mood in this country today to proceed and and i would highly re recommend that we do so thank you sir um it's not a bad suggestion about having new members on in fact we i suppose we shouldn't go we shouldn't go further than that and have people who are just elected should be later this year put on when they arrive we could put them on this instead of a regular committee so they won't mind being on do you have any questions of the gentleman? Uh, just, uh, no, I think it is very helpful. I think it's a very good idea. Uh, the, the membership of the committee has actually expanded, John, so it seems to me that there might be a chance to have uh, the input of a new member uh, on the committee. And I thank you for your work, and I think you're doing a great job here. Thank you, sir. I thank appreciate, you, I appreciate the fact that you don't want to eliminate the Rules Committee. He just wants to reform I don't. us. <laughs> he, does, he does want to reform us, though. Mr. Kandorsky is next, but Paul, if you'll be so kind, we've not yet had a chance to vote. We'll recess for about three minutes and we'll be right back.
Honorable Member from Pennsylvania. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I uh, am a co-sponsor of the Hamilton Gredison Resolution, uh, House Concurrent Resolution 192, and I strongly urge its adoption. I think perhaps uh, it's late, but it's better late than never. I think it's very clearly that the country is moving in an area that Congress nor the executive have been responsive to. I'm only sorry that the resolution also doesn't contain the authority for a total reorganization and review of the executive branch of government because as we reorganize Congress, uh, we will see that it has a misfit with the executive organization. I was very impressed in the Nixon administration that they talked about reorganizing the executive branch along functional lines. If that had occurred, the Congress likewise should organize along functional lines so that we really have a match in government which gives a stronger rapport and relationship between the executive and the legislative. That not Paul, being if we find out we're doing a really good job, we can call up the president, whoever he might be, in another year or so and suggest that we well, fix them up too. I think that would be ideal and I hope that we would have the uh, latitude here and that the reorganization of Congress occurs based not fitting with the existing structure of the executive branch, but what would be the ideal structure yeah. if that were place, put in place on a functional so level. That's an interesting idea and a very useful one. And it may well be that this might lead to something of that sort if we see that we ought to be, forgive me for interrupting, um, if, you know, if, we're, if we're moving in that direction, it seems to make an awful lot of sense. There's no reason in the world why we shouldn't try to revamp this and, and speak about the other problem as well. I appreciate that, and I hope that I could lend any support to that. I think that uh, the idea that we haven't had a reorganization since 1946, and that today there are seven cabinet departments that didn't even exist in 1946. What we have a tendency, both in the Congress and the executive, to do is structure the government along the lines of interest groups and specific industries or organized effort in society, rather than looking at government as a management function. And I think that we would be wise to uh, uh, restructure and perhaps even reshuffle the uh, committee structure in the Congress so that it is least responsive uh, to either constituent needs on a parochial basis or especially expert interests on a membership basis. And that what we really should be looking for is uh, a spreading of the effort among the members, uh, tightening up the time, certainly uh, putting great emphasis on the one structure uh, in, in the form that would, I think, help not only the Congress perform its function in a more efficient and effective manner, but also lend assistance to the executive branch, and that is the area of oversight. I think if I had to say the one great weakness of the Congress is that we have a tendency to fix it by passing a law, but unfortunately we never test out whether the law is being properly implemented and carried out. And that takes extensive investigation, oversight by the committees of Congress, and we tend to pay the least attention to that. So that in any reorganization plan, I would hope that we more uh, efficiently and effectively utilize the organization of the membership of the Congress to perform their essence of oversight that I has been. I couldn't agree with you more. I think our, our, in many respects, our most important function is that, is, is that of oversight. And in my reading, to this member at least, I think we do a less good job at that than we do at almost anything else. Uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would hope that because of the structure of the committee, and I compliment the makers of the resolution, that we really see a bipartisan effort here where both the minority and the majority are viewed on an equal basis and that uh, we would get a commitment from the minority that when we do go to reorganization of the executive branch, it is made with the same type of uh, structure so that there is not a partisan benefit to, uh, uh, regardless of who may occupy the executive branch at the time, but that we treat it, truly look at it on a bipartisan basis for the benefit of the country as a whole. Uh, I would hope that uh, as we, we go through the structure that we do pay attention to the inordinate attention that the, that the media and the public have paid to what they consider perks and privileges, that we should minimize those, that we should attempt in every way to bring the membership of Congress and the executive branch in line with the way the average American pursues his daily life, and that we remove the imperialism of office, whether it be here on the Hill or whether it be down at the White House and in the executive branch, so that Americans feel they have a most, more closely uh, knit attachment to the people that govern them. I think that in anticipating the uh, a far-reaching constitutional amendment which will come before the Congress in the next two weeks 
and the fact that it is gaining uh, uh, popular sp uh, speed without its ultimate implications and effects on the constitutional process of government in the United States and even the very structure of government indicates to what level frustration has gone in this country. I for myself find that it's unfortunate that we have to perhaps in some respects destroy the constitutional form that we have by p trying to put uh, some uh, constraint on both the executive and the Congress, but apparently that will become uh, uh, necessary. But before that is implemented by the states, maybe by reorganizing the Congress and the executive branch, we can attend to some of the foibles that exist, the lack of cooperation and comedy between the two branches of government, and increase them, and in so doing also perhaps uh, improve the relationship between the House and the Senate so that it can be more effectively, uh, as the Framing Fathers intended, the one being the deliberative House and the other working the will of the people, but in concert to attend uh, to the national good of all. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Any questions, Mr. Solomon? <clears throat> Paul, I'm sorry I missed the uh, first part of your testimony, but uh, he wants uh, to he wants to reorganize your part of the government, the executive uh -huh. branch. <laughs> well, I was uh, I was listening and reading his testimony, and uh, just note that you became a co-sponsor of this legislation uh, same day I did back in September. So we commend you for that, and uh, look forward to your support. I appreciate you coming before us. Thank you very much, Mr. Solomon. Thank you, sir, very much. Next on our list, Wayne Allard, Colorado. Good to have you here, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Hello, sir, uh, Congressman Solomon. Uh, I uh, would like to uh, preface my remarks by saying that uh, I served for eight years in the Colorado General Assembly. The state of Colorado is known as a state who has looked very thoughtfully at their legislative process and has probably done things that other states haven't done. and. Uh, because of that, I think I've had some experience that I can share with you that we've done in our own state legislature. And I would suggest to the chairman that if you're truly interested in reforming Congress, that you take a hard look at the state legislatures and seeing what they're doing to establish some accountability and to maintain some simplicity in the process. If we want the citizens of this country to understand Congress and what it's doing, I think this, the more accountability we have, the better which means that you have a simplified process that's rather straightforward. I think that's very important in congressional reform. Uh, the states, like the state of Colorado, for example, they have a balanced budget. They do have a line item veto, which I think is much more simpler for the average public to understand than the rescission process that we go through right now, which is extremely complicated, very difficult to explain to your constituents how that goes about. Um, in the state of Colorado, we have sunshine laws where the citizens can follow very closely what is happening. Uh, I ran the majority caucus uh, in a public meeting and it was uh, closely monitored all the time. In fact, Colorado has gone so far as to say in the caucus that you couldn't even bind a member to vote one way or the other on the floor. Uh, that's how far we've gone in, in legislative reform. We also had timelines that were uh, within our Constitution, and we were expected to comply with those timelines. And I think that would help a lot here if we could set up some specific timelines. I heard that from the individual before me that was testifying, suggest that perhaps maybe we could work on sticking to some timelines. I'd like to focus on a few things that would not be so academic in nature, but maybe suggest to you specifically on what we might do for congressional reform. I think we ought to look very closely at committee reform, for example. Uh, look at coordinating some efforts between the House and the Senate. Being a relatively new member to Congress, maybe you already have a committee to do that. But uh, I think some coordination between the House and the Senate on scheduling and planning, uh, which m many legislatures do have, and we had one in our legislature, and we had concurrent joint resolutions where we agreed on some general rules of the game, and when certain things were going to happen in both the House and Senate, we knew that they had certain timelines to comply with. And, and those concurrent resolutions laid out before the session began how we were a plan for that particular session. Uh, I think another thing that could happen in the committee that would help a lot is to eliminate proxy voting. Uh, in the, uh, the state legislature, we didn't have proxy voting. I think that was an incentive for members to be present in the committee, to hear testimony, and to be there to vote. 
Now I see in the Congress that we have a lot of committees and a lot of them I think are there because uh, members realize they don't have to be there to vote. And if you re make a requirement for them to be the president to vote, I think they will be a little more judicious on wanting to serve on so many committees. And I think they'll better understand those particular issues. Uh, so it will, by eliminating proxy voting, I think we can reduce the number of committees. And then we can also look at eliminating the duplication of our committee. Just look at their title on those committees and also uh, uh, look at areas where we might be able to eliminate some of those committees just by looking at their title. So I talked a little bit about scheduling. Uh, I think the subcommittees uh, and that I've had in some of my general overall committees, uh, there's even a duplication where they meet at the same time within my same reference committee. And if there was some scheduling time, even on the subcommittees within the major committees, I think it would help our scheduling an awful lot and uh, prevent us from having have a conflict of attending two subcommittees within the same the subject area at the same time. Uh, committee rationing, where you set the membership of the committee up to the same proportion that you have on the floor between Republicans and Democrats is fair. And I don't think that you would find any member of, the, uh, of either party uh, who could, you know, object to that type of rationing. And I think you ought to look closely at that. I think one subject bills helps an awful lot. For example, at the end of last session, we got into so-called the Marshall Rule, where we had these uh, uh, bills come in, and then all of a sudden we had all different types of subjects on, on, on bills uh, came, coming through at the last minute. And what I saw happening on the Senate side, for example, we had sort of a, lay, a kind of uh, lay and wait game to the end of the session, then all of a sudden you had all these amendments that pounced off on the Senate side and came over here, and were even uh, being asked to vote on coming onto the floor at the time members were heading home or thinking about heading home. Uh, another area that I would mention real quickly is that Congress, in order to maintain some accountability, I think needs to stop exempting itself from the laws it expects everybody else to, to live under. Now, I know the, the constitutional argument on that. But the practical argument that it's hard for a congressman to really understand the full impact a lot of that and the, and the concerns of the citizens unless they have to live under those uh, uh, same laws. Uh, I think that um, uh, James Madison, to quickly wrap up my testimony, uh, hit the nail on the head in the, when he said that if you have a, a legislature that exempts itself from the same laws that everybody else lives under, you've created an elite body. And uh, I think there's a real concern out there among the American citizen whether we are treating ourselves as a privileged class or not. I've tried to be constructive in my comments, Mr. Chairman, and hope that they're helpful in your deliberations. I'd like to compliment you for holding these hearings. It means that you're concerned in the process and would like to see some changes. And anything that moves forward, I'd like to be a part of that. Thank you very much, sir. You have, in fact, been very very constructive in your comments. You've made several very good ones. The ones that I recall offhand that I, you know, that I myself uh, like the best were your, your, your comments with respect to proxy voting. Committees I've been on recently have not had it. I don't really understand why people need to have it. I suppose I'll get in trouble with my leadership for having said that publicly. Um, and what I take it you were talking about to a certain extent was, was germaneness when you're talking about one subject bills. To a, to a large extent we're fairly good about that on the House side. We get in real trouble from the other side because they send things back with, with an enormous number of subjects uh, appended to it, and we do our best to strip them from it. But uh, on the whole, we, we, we handle that fairly well on, on the House side. But one could certainly express the hope that our friends from the other body, who also, of course, will be involved in this joint committee, would, would change their rules, at least with respect to, uh, to that. Mr. Also, Chairman, may sure. I interject there? Absolutely. Um, I think if you have a, a legislative council that sort of coordinates efforts between the House and the Senate. They give us a forum to talk about that problem on the House side and bring those issues forward. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I also agree with you about our living under the same laws or rules as, as other folks throughout the country. Uh, and you, you did allude, and I won't, I won't comment on it other than just again alluding to it, the, the constitutional problem. And it may well be that what I think is important that we, is that we live under the same rules as other people, not necessarily the same laws if they could be parallel laws and, and be enforceable. 
which I know is a concern of yours, but I mean, it may well be that we that these should be enforced by our own people rather than by the you know, the branch of government, but certainly the rules and the standards and criteria under which we have to live should be the same as, as other people. And finally, uh, your best single idea, although it's much more than a single idea, of course, is a very good one, and one which no one has mentioned in the two days of hearings which we've had, and that is uh, to take a, a good look at what some of the state legislatures do. Most, many of us are from state legislatures originally. Uh, there are some differences, obviously. Things here, I mean, back home, wherever home is, is, is smaller and simpler to a certain extent than, than here. Uh, but but uh, especially in the last decade or more, many state legislatures uh, uh, have um, have come up with some very useful ideas and are working under rules which uh, I think would be equally applicable to ourselves. And, and, and one of your, at least that one suggestion of yours, we will, some of us will be sending along specifically to whoever it is that's, that's appointed, who are appointed to this committee, is the suggestion that they send somebody around to look very quickly and carefully at what some of the some of the other state what some of the state legislatures do, because I'm sure I'm sure we can learn something from them. Thank Thanks, you, Mr. Wayne. Chairman. Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> well, Wayne, let me uh, let me also thank you for coming to testify. I'll tell you, your testimony providing specific recommendations based on uh, based on experience with your state legislature, uh, I think has really been some of the most constructive testimony we've had. Thank I can't be that flattering about the New York state legislature, although we had some good points too, uh, but we had a lot of the fallacies that we have right here in the, in the, in the Congress. But uh, the points that you make about committee reform and, and coordinating with the, with the Senate uh, could be very, very helpful in, in uh, doing away with this gridlock that we seem to have because uh, they certainly uh, are at fault and we're at fault. And if we can work more closely together based on, on rules that we both had to, to live by, I think we'd be a lot more effective. So I really appreciate you coming before the committee and uh, uh, we'll Thank look you. forward to calling on your expertise uh, as we go along. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to join Wayne in saying that, uh, that John Boehner was here a little while ago and the idea of having freshman involvement has already started by virtue of the testimony which you and John have provided. Uh, new members bring to this rules committee and I hope ultimately to this joint committee which will be establishing a very healthy and uh, unique perspective, not just by virtue of having served in the state legislature, which I never did, but you have literally been on the front line outside of this institution. And uh, I agree with, with the proposals as far as proxy voting. We on this committee don't have proxy voting. It's not allowed. And I guess, was it on the Intelligence Committee you had no proxy voting? I don't voting? think we did. I don't yeah. recall any. Right. And um, I, I think that- I don't recall that, having uh, had the votes either. Yeah. <laughs> Most things. Right. Uh, we uh, we really should do away with it. And also, I did. I was sorry I didn't hear uh, all of your testimony. Are you, as a new member, having come in, are you supportive of the concept of reducing the number of committees on which members serve? Yeah. As I mentioned in my testimony, I think uh, there's a potential to drop down to 26, reduced by 26 committees. If you just look at their titles and look where duplication is. And one way that you control the number of committees that they serve on is you require proxy voting. Another, I mean, you, you don't allow Eliminate proxy voting, voting yeah. because then they're not going to want to serve on all those committees because they just can't be everywhere at once, and you're going to have to be there to cast that vote. I think that's one way of limiting the number of committees that members will want to serve on if they understand that they have to be there to vote. Let me ask you a, a raw political question which came to the uh, fore in uh, our hearing yesterday. Um, one of our witnesses made the case that uh, it would be uh, really uh, impossible for us to limit members to one committee. The reason being that <clears throat> it is essential that members uh, let their constituents know that they have uh, authority in um, a wide range of areas and uh, with committees usurping so much responsibility and then each of the disparate subcommittees under them and members serving on how many subcommittees do you serve on now Wayne? Uh, I would say seven subcommittees. Seven subcommittees. Uh, it, you know it does seem to me that that was the same number that John Boehner gave uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Me on nine subcommittees. And as a new member coming in, would you, having gone through your first campaign, an election of the House, did you feel, 
coming here that it was essential for you to seek seven subcommittee what what I'm sorry I don't know what committees uh, well you I have. came in with a goal to serve on one committee uh, mm -hmm. that was important what and committee that, is that that which was agriculture committee because mm -hmm. you're on the agriculture committee I'm on an agriculture I'm on the agriculture committee I have an agricultural district and so I and my background is a veterinarian by the way mm -hmm. and so I Great. felt like my expertise as well as my district could serve by my getting on it the other two committees uh, came uh, by way of you know uh, the committee on committees and you mm -hmm. list in priority those that you would mm -hmm. like to serve on and uh, one of the committees that they had a hard time getting somebody to want to serve on I says well I feel like I would like to go ahead and take on that responsibility so I agreed to go ahead and serve on one what of committee was that it was uh, interior committee mm -hmm. well uh, let me just say this. which so, by the way is not as competitive to get on on the Republican side as I understand on the Democrat side yeah well, let me say this then then you feel having come in here as a new member having just been elected that if you had sought one committee and if you'd gotten onto the agriculture committee that you would have uh, not dealt with political problems at home that some have predicted would have taken place. Yes, I think that that can mm -hmm. be stated. But, you know, I think a lot of your constituents uh, look at uh, what you're going to be doing for them here. You don't necessarily, one uh, committee work is one way of doing that. Uh, floor activity is another way of doing that. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk too much about floor activity, but if you open up the floor activity a little more than what you have now, give more people to speak on mm -hmm. uh, some of those issues, perhaps maybe that's where they could go back to their constituents and say, see, I'm doing something uh, for you as your voice here in Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see it as being a problem by reducing the number of committees. Mm -hmm. Because if you look again at the title of those committees, there's a mm -hmm. lot of duplication on those mm -hmm. titles. You can just look at the title of the community. Of the it's very, see their it's very helpful to have you say that uh, yeah. because of the concern that was raised in the hearing yesterday uh, about uh, the electoral challenges yeah. that members would face. Well, you, let, let me let me ask this, Wayne. Are, you know, you you have had a, a pretty cohesive class. I think John said that uh, Democrats, Republicans are what 48 uh, freshman members. Yes, and. Uh, would you say that most of your freshman colleagues would concur with what you've said on this uh, committee structure? Uh, from those you know, on, on one I, committee, on the, that they would be satisfied with one committee. With one committee, you know, I don't think I can speak specifically for them. Mm -hmm. I don't know as I've ever been in a meeting where we uh, uh, specifically talked about about that. We talked all have about limiting the number of committees generically. Do you have Do you have regular uh, meetings of your uh, class? your new members? Um, we do meet on the Republican side regularly, but and then we meet periodically on a bipartisan basis. Well, I'd just like to make a request of you, since this topic has come up, and that is to, to, to take a sampling of Democrat and Republican members in the freshman class who've come off of tough elections and see what kind of consensus there might be for uh, reducing the number of committees on which a member would serve. Let me try and respond to your question this way. I was a freshman class representative on Committee on Committees, mm -hmm. and I understand how members in the freshman class lobbied to get under those committees, and I fought for those positions for them. But most of them had one committee in mind when they talked mm -hmm. to me that they thought was really important. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, they were willing to, to be generally team players. Mm -hmm. So I don't see that uh, one committee would be a, uh, much of a problem. That's very helpful to hear. I mm -hmm. think, uh, Mr. Chairman, we should probably hear from a freshman Democrat on this to see if the feeling is similar. Uh, have you talked, you said you haven't done really a sampling, but have you talked to Democrats on, on uh, this issue? No. At all? No. Well, it would be helpful we, I mean, to us if you We've talked would. about yeah. reducing the number of committees and got a mm -hmm. general consensus on that. How far back do you go in the number of committees that members serve on? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think you can easily let a member serve on three subcommittees, and I think he can cover his interest areas mm -hmm. in a lot of ways by just doing that. Mm -hmm. Under one full committee, yeah. then. Mm -hmm. Or two. Or if you're under two general committees, say you're under two subcommittees here and one over here under general. Are you willing to take on that responsibility of talking to some of your fellow freshmen? I would be willing to visit with Great. them and see how they feel about serving on one Perfect. committee. I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear. Why don't we let them go back, back down to the floor so we can talk to them all? Excuse me? Yeah. Why don't we let them go back down to the floor so we can Thank talk you, to them? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very Your much. testimony was helpful, uh, Thank Wayne. And actually, I found, I'd say to my friend from California, perhaps the, the gentleman, gentleman's most interesting and useful 
and helpful piece of testimony was the fact that he's a veterinarian. So when we finally do get rid of the physician of the capital, we can <laughs> go to him. <laughs> go to you for our, for our problems. Thank you very much. Uh, you bet, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, Mr. Glenn Poshard. Poshard. Do I pronounce you correctly, Glenn? I'm sorry. It's Poshard. That's sorry, right, Mr. Chairman. Mr. See Bouchard, from Mr. Illinois, it's good to have you here, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the opportunity to testify before your committee on behalf of H. Conrad's 192, establishing the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. I appreciate the time and consideration. I'm submitting uh, testimony for the record, but uh, I Let me just interrupt you very quickly. We do have your statement, and it will be, uh, without objection, included in, in its entirety in the record, and you're welcome either to read from it or to speak whatever part of it you like. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I won't go over it verbatim. I would rather, uh, I think for a moment, just uh, talk to you about some of my perceptions that I gained from a recent um, uh, campaign that I ran in a primary. Uh, successfully to Illinois. Illinois. Yes, sir. Thankfully, it was successful for me. And uh, uh, I think more than most members at this time of the year, I covered uh, just about every nook and cranny of 27 counties in southern and central Illinois. And uh, it was amazing to me the perception of the public at this point in time of the Congress. And as I, uh, as I campaigned uh, over those counties, I sensed that there's a political disconnectedness out there between the people and their perception of the Congress right now. Uh, no matter where I went, people continued to ask the question about uh, why are our children scoring in the lower one quarter percentile of all comparative tests in uh, math and science with international students? Uh, why are we bailing out SNLs to the tune of three or four hundred billion dollars? Our financial institutions failing? Why, in effect, are we losing our manufacturing base and industrial wage jobs in the country? Why is our health care system not serving 40 million people and millions more are underinsured and can't get insurance? The essential institutions of this country, the societal institutions in the minds of the public, they see as failing. And they see us, not just the Congress, but the administration also, as responsible for the public policy that guides those institutions. And it's beginning to connect up in their mind as to why it is that the societal institutions for which we have responsibility are failing, at least perception-wise, at the same time when we're getting reelected to the uh, tune of 99% every term, almost, without opposition. And I think it used to be that the public mind perception was, well, my congressman or congresswoman is doing a really good job, but that Congress is doing a lousy job when it comes to public policy making to guide the essential institutions of this country. And that disconnectedness that they feel uh, is beginning to weigh in at a lot of different levels in the public mind in my judgment. Now I know that's an external political disconnectedness in their minds. But I think to whatever extent we can address that or connect that up through internal administrative changes or reforms to at least give the public the understanding that we are accountable here, that this Congress does act in a responsible manner, that we are interested in public policy issues and not just the things that, that they perceive as incumbent protection devices to keep us getting reelected. Uh, while they perceive us as, as abdicating our role as public policymakers. And to the extent that we can do that through this joint resolution uh, in terms of the internal reforms that need to be made, and there are many, and we could go over with specificity, uh, hundreds of them, I think, the frustration that all of us feel in serving here. I, too, serve on, uh, I think, seven subcommittees and two major committees. Uh, there are days in this Congress when I spend 15 minutes in a committee and leave it so I can go to the next committee and get registered in and not fear that uh, I, I do not get counted on the rolls there. Now, I need time to devote to that committee, to study the issues there, to spend the full time listening to the full range of witnesses. And we don't do it. 
because we don't want to miss three subcommittee hearings that are going on at the same time, and sometimes even a full committee. So we need to look at that schedule in terms of how many committees we serve on, how do we schedule ourselves so that we spend time studying the issues that are relevant to this country. This going back and forth every weekend to our district serving out here two and three days and then flying back home. I fly into an airport and then drive three hours to my home. It's an exhaustive schedule that all of us handle. Uh, we go back there for uh, a lot of times for political reasons, not just to keep our pulse on uh, the, the, the district. We don't have enough time out here to really study and engage ourselves in all that we need to, to do to be good public policy makers. I think we need to look at that. I think we need to consider the Senate schedule, maybe being out here for a couple of weeks and going home for a week. Uh, too much travel time, too much time in the air, too much time away from the essential duties of the committees on which we serve. Um, I don't know. There's, there's a lot that needs to be done. I, I would just like to see us address it in a forthright manner. I think that uh, there's only so many things we can do. I have my own judgments about those external political considerations, but I think there's a lot we can do internally here. Uh, to achieve more accountability than we have, have achieved in the past. And I just wanted to put my two cents worth in. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your two cents are very welcome and very well put. And, and I refer my colleagues on the committee to your prepared testimony, too, which I found very thoughtful and very good when you speak about taking a, a broader look at the, at, the, uh, at the questions and the changes that, uh, that are made so that they're coherent and needed in reforming rather than simply reactionary. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Glenn. Thank yes. you, sir. Thank you very much. It's an excellent testimony, and uh, I hope we'll take some of your recommendations. And I'm happy to hear. And you're in your second term, right? Yes, sir. Glenn? Um, it, you know the, the line of question that I had uh, going with Wayne Allard there. What, what is your sense about going to one committee? You say you're frustrated about having to report into one subcommittee and then be accounted president of another subcommittee. Would you be satisfied with one major committee? Well, let me say this. If we're going to continue the, the two committees and all the subcommittees, we need to keep the uh, proxy because there's no way to make them all. Mm -hmm. I don't want to miss my, my uh, uh, vote on important issues right. in committees because I have studied those issues and just because I can't make it there, I'm tied up in another committee or two more committees. Obviously, mean, obviously, so. if you're able to expend the, the amount of time that you want to on an issue, then proxy voting won't be necessary because right. you'll be able to be there and participate. So would you then support the concept of, of a single committee yes. and elimination of proxy voting? Yes, absolutely. I think that, that gives us a chance to get more in depth into the issues. We all have to be generalists out here anyway, uh, Congressman Dreyer. I think we all know that. Whether we serve on one committee or two, we all uh, have to be broad-based in our knowledge of a thousand different issues. That doesn't mean we know everything about them, but, but whether we have one or two committees, we're still going to have to go home and talk about five different things over the course of a day and five more different things the next day. That comes with the territory. Well, let, let me pose the, the, the same challenge to you that I did to Wayne, and that, that would be to, to try and find from your classmates, I mean, being in second term, what the sense is, if there's agreement on that. And we office on the same hall, and so I will uh, see you there, and we'll be able All to... Right. Uh, I'll, I'll certainly uh, try to find that out. I think we either have to lengthen the days that we have out here if we're going to keep the same committees or if we're going to continue the same schedule, get rid of the proxy and, and give each person one major well, Let me committee. just ask this then. Would you be actually willing to give up one of the committees on which you now serve? Sure. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd only say in passing, Dave, that I would hope, one would hope that the, uh, the committee when it's established, as I su suspect it will be, will, among other things, be asking members how they feel about some of the proposals that might be made. This is obviously one area where they, they, they can ask people, should ask people. We should tell them to do so. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, sir. Okay, I have, a more dif I have a difficult choice here now. Dick, you were here earlier. Mr. Congressman Dick Zimmer, uh, New Jersey. Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman yeah. Bacchus and I are a match pair. We're a team. Then you'll have to wait for John Tanner, Congressman John Tanner <laughs> for Tennessee. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Dreyer. I, uh, I have a short statement that I would like to submit for the record. That objection will be included in its entirety in the record. And it basically just urges uh, swift uh, action on this proposal. Yeah, I think we're going to do that. Two, two things I would like to add to that, if I may, very quickly. I know uh, you all have heard a lot of testimony about all of this. It seems to me that the phenomenon of term limits that's sweeping the country is indicative of the uh, unrest. The fact that it's a creditable uh, uh, movement, I think, indicates the uh, frustration that not only members here have, but the general public has with the way things are going. Rather than, uh, I think, limit uh, a voter's right to choose whomever they wish at a ballot box, which to me is a fairly draconian, draconian measure, particularly in light of the fact that people all over the world in developing democracies are dying for the right to vote or the chance to vote at the ballot box, some killed in line, standing in line to vote. Uh, rather than term limits, I think we uh, need to consider uh, rotation of committee assignments here. I think uh, uh, one of our members has suggested we rotate the chairman. I would think it would be a good idea to rotate committee assignments, particularly if we go to one committee. Uh, we do that on the budget committee now, so there is precedent for that, and it would give all members uh, a chance to serve on different committees during their career here. It would also infuse the committees with new ideas from time to time, and not new ideas necessarily off the street, but new ideas from people who know how the system works, which hopefully would lend itself to a more efficient uh, operation. The second thing I would like to, uh, to bring to the table is uh, the idea of a line item veto, but with a simple majority to override. Some of the people who've testified here to four today that I've heard have said that in their state legislature they did one thing or another. In Tennessee, we have a line item veto, or we have a veto power, but it takes only a simple majority to override. Now, one might think at first blush, if that's all it takes to override, then it'd be a very simple matter to override a governor's veto after a bill's been passed by a simple majority. In actual practice, that's not the case at all. And I would say our governor in Tennessee's uh, veto overriding ratios are, are would not be out of line with, with uh, others across the country who do not have uh, or who have a more stringent uh, requirement for uh, a, a, an override. Um, that to me would uh, simplify the system, make it understandable to the general public, and uh, would also not upset the very delicate balance between the executive branch and the uh, legislative branch in that uh, under the current uh, situation, it's my uh, feeling that you would upset that balance if you insisted on two-thirds to override. You don't really perhaps save any money, you just merely change the priorities of the country uh, and give those to one person rather than a broad-based uh, group of, uh, of properly elected people. With those comments, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and the committee for thank you, John, bringing this to uh, to our attention. Mr. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. I've You're going to send him out to ask for the to ask uh, the opinions of the people in his class as to how they feel about that? Well, since he's a classmate of Glenn's, I've already assigned Glenn yeah, right. responsibility. Okay. So you don't have anything more to do? Well, I appreciate your comments on the veterinarian. Uh, many people have told me at home what a dog they thought uh, I was uh, from time to time. By yeah, we, don't, and we don't share their opinion, John. It would say, we could say, you know, we have a veterinarian look after us, huh? Do you, John, uh, like the, uh, the idea of going down to one I think it has great merit, David. I, I wish we could, if, when we do that, consider the rotation of committees from time to time, six year, eight year. Or even year. as someone earlier suggested, a changing of the, to a certain extent, of the jurisdiction of the committee so that you might, you might widen you them a little bit and make them a little bit more interesting. That's right. So, forth, I, so they'll yes, give you plenty to do. All of us are plagued with conflicting uh, meetings going on uh, all day long. Thank you very much, Thanks. sir. Okay, we get a, apparently we get a two for now. Uh, we have Honorable Congressman Dick Zimmer from New Jersey and Jim Backus from Florida, the Sunshine Boys. You can talk to us about Sunshine That's and Government. Right. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Backus. Mr. Dreyer, members of the committee, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today with my friend and colleague from across the aisle, Dick Zimmer of New Jersey to discuss uh, House Joint Resolution 192 and the very critical issue of congressional reform. 
Uh, Mr. Zimmer and I both applaud the bipartisan efforts of our colleagues, uh, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Gratison, on behalf of this resolution. Uh, we believe that congressional approval of this resolution would be an important step toward restoring public confidence in the Congress and making the Congress more responsive to the needs and realities of our nation today. The Joint Committee on the Organization of the Congress will allow us to take a bipartisan, deliberative approach to streamlining and modernizing our committee structure and improving the work of the federal government as a whole. Uh, my primary goal in appearing before this committee today is to urge you to broaden the scope of the hamilton Gratison resolution to include two other reforms that I believe are critical to regaining the people's trust. Uh, I have spoken with Mr. Hamilton uh, personally about uh, our appearance here today, and he believes that what we're proposing is consistent uh, with uh, his uh, general intent, and I believe Mr. Uh, Zimmer has uh, spoken with Mr. Gratison. The first reform uh, that we propose pertains to open meeting rules as they are applied to committees of the Congress, uh, and the other reform pertains to financial disclosure requirements for members of Congress and candidates for Congress. While there have been laudable improvements in these areas in recent years, both our open meeting and our financial disclosure rules uh, remain riddled with loopholes that tend to erode public confidence in the Congress. Closing these loopholes and increasing the openness of our endeavors, in my view, are essential to our efforts to regain the trust and support of the people we represent. Let me first address the issue of our open meeting rules. I come from Florida and Florida helped invent uh, government in the sunshine and uh, I was proud for some time to be in the state government and be a part of uh, government in the sunshine in Florida. I believe in open government. In the past two decades, the Congress has made remarkable progress in opening up hearings and markups that previously had routinely been closed to the public, in part because of the work of uh, our previous senator and now governor from Florida, Lawton Childs. However, our current rules still contain a giant loophole in that committee members can vote to close meetings for any reason. Uh, Mr. Zimmer and I have filed legislation, uh, House Resolution 310, to allow meetings to be closed only for two reasons. One, if disclosure of matters to be considered would endanger the national security. And two, if evidence or testimony at an investigative hearing would defame, degrade, or incriminate any person. I believe that the public's right to know is fundamental and with the exceptions I have noted overrides any other reason for a closed meeting. After all, it is the public's business we're conducting. Secrecy can be especially dangerous at a time when there is so much public concern that government is working for special interests and not really for the public. One way to help restore public faith in the integrity and accountability of the Congress is to improve our rules governing our open meetings and also our open records. I think it was Louis Brandeis who said that sunlight is the best disinfectant. My second concern involves our financial disclosure rules. Currently, members of Congress are required by the Ethics in Government Act only to list assets and liabilities within broad categories of value. Uh, the ranges are so broad, in fact, that it is impossible to tell from a report whether a member received a large increase in income from particular sources. I have filed legislation, H.R. 2348, uh, co-sponsored by Mr. Zimmer, to require much more detailed financial disclosure by members of Congress and candidates for Congress. Uh, this bill calls for the listing of exact amounts and sources of all assets and all liabilities. It also would require members and candidates alike to file an annual statement of net worth and also copies of their tax returns from the previous year. I have made such disclosure voluntarily as a candidate for Congress and uh, uh, last year and again this year as a member of the Congress in order to set uh, the example I think I should. Uh, previously in Florida I helped uh, co-author the Sunshine Amendment to the Florida Constitution which mandates uh, full public financial disclosure of this time kind by elected officials in Florida. I think we should do the same here in Washington. These changes which we suggested in the disclosure laws would provide the public with information that ensures that we members of Congress are not benefiting financially from holding office. The public deserves to know what we own, what we owe, and who we owe, down to the last penny. Only then will they know that we are working for them and not for ourselves or for some special interest. 
Uh, these two bills that, uh, that we are supporting and have originated may not be the ideal approaches for addressing these issues, which is why we're suggesting that the Commission consider these two issues in its deliberations. However, I do believe that a successful effort to regain the public's trust must address both the issues of open government and comprehensive financial disclosure. Uh, so I urge you to amend House Joint Resolution 192 to include these two issues in the scope of jurisdiction for the Joint Committee on the Organization of the Congress. I would be pleased to suggest language for such uh, amendments in cooperation with Mr. Zimmer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your time and attention and look forward to our debate on this very important resolution. Thank you. Mr. Zimmer, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to appear before this committee, and, and I'm, I'm very uh, pleased that the committee has decided uh, to consider and have two days of hearings on H. Conrez 192, which uh, Congressman Backus and I are both uh, co-sponsors. Uh, there is a growing recognition, I think, that in many ways uh, Congress just doesn't work. Uh, the current system absorbs a tremendous amount of time and energy from thousands of very talented and capable individuals, but the output is not commensurate with the input. It's been more than 20 years since uh, Congress uh, last uh, reformed itself, and since that time, normal organizational ent entropy and, and human nature in the form of, uh, of uh, empire building and self-aggrandizement have made this uh, much, a much less effective uh, body and, and in need of another overhaul. And I think that uh, a majority of our colleagues, uh, certainly a majority of our constituents, feel that Congress should consider measures to make this institution more responsive to the needs of today's society. Uh, I think we all, I agree with, uh, the, uh, with my colleague, uh, Mr. Backus, that this, should, uh, this enterprise should also focus on restoring public confidence in the institution. And uh, that's why I have co-sponsored with him uh, both the financial disclosure and the open meetings uh, uh, legislation. Has anyone else co-sponsored it yet with us, Jim? We have a few. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. For a while, we were the lonely, uh, lonely pair on those bills. Uh, but I think that this is a focus, this, this area is a focus that should not be neglected uh, by uh, the Joint Committee when it is created. Uh, the, uh, since so much of our important work is done in committee, it's absolutely essential, I believe, that committees do their work uh, in public, uh, that uh, the public and their representatives in the media, including the broadcast media, should be free uh, to uh, attend and to cover uh, the proceedings. And I also believe that the public is entitled to, uh, to know the, all the details of our personal finances. One, other element of sunshine, I believe, that would be appropriate for this body is to have uh, the House covered by the Freedom of Information Act uh, in the same way uh, that other agencies of government are, with exceptions for constituent communications and, and casework records. I think that uh, that would not only help uh, 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 disabuse the public of the, of the thought that we might be applying double standards to ourselves, but it would uh, apply that great disinfectant of sunshine that. Uh, Congressman Backus re referred to in a very important and effective way. Uh, I, in short, I, I don't think our constituents should have to uh, watch us like hawks, but they should be able to. And uh, I think that these proposals uh, are the sort of things that the mandate of the uh, Joint Committee should be expanded to uh, encompass. I think we would restore public through our edict. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I think the way to restore public confidence in us is for us to start doing the kinds of things the public wants us to do. No um, I'm not sure that I'm not suggesting I'm not arguing against your particular you know specific proposals, but we could adopt them and many others. And still, if we didn't do our job the way we should be doing it, or the way people, as I suggested, wanted us to do it, um, they still wouldn't have any confidence in it, even if we were all televised, and even if they could read all of our tax returns. Uh, Jim, you suggested that. Uh, one of the reasons for, for opening meetings even further than they are now, although to the best of my knowledge and understanding, generally speaking, meetings around here are open. I mean, Intelligence Committee is not, but most, most committee meetings are, are open. I most, mean, they are seldom closed. Most committee meetings are open. Right. That, that is correct. But you did suggest, I mean, and I'm not arguing with you about that, but you suggest that one reason that, that, that we should have that is because people otherwise might conclude that that uh, government is working for special interests. Uh, my answer to that is to is to ban all special interest money. I think if you if you're really serious, inter seriously interested in people's feeling that uh, special interests aren't playing too big a role around here, we should we should uh, 
prohibit their giving money or our accepting money uh, from them at, at election time. I think that's an easier and more straightforward way of simply keeping meetings open. That's certainly also an essential reform, and it's one that both you and I have voted for. Right. And um, secondly and finally, and I don't mean to, again, to argue so much with respect to this, with respect to financial disclosure, I'm not sure what's right about that, frankly. Uh, I am for it to certainly to a, to a certain extent, uh, to the extent we have it now, I think. I, I don't find so much fault as you did, Jim, in your testimony, and I guess Dick, perhaps in your prepared testimony too, which incidentally both of you will be included in the, in the record in entirety. Um, I don't find I don't find too much of a problem that they're being too in, in that they're, we are allowed too broad a range of, of, of telling what our assets and our income uh, is. People get a pretty pretty good feel I think for how much me members around here are worth, uh, what they have money invested in. We are required, as you know, to to divide to divulge that now. I think the public now can tell. Um, can be assured, because I think it's true in virtually every case, that we are not benefiting from office, and you can, t from serving in our office here, in the office of Cong member of Congress, and I think you can tell easily enough from looking at our at our disclosure uh, statements now, just having filed them again, we're you know we're we're all uh, well well aware uh, of that. I, I don't know, and again I'm just throwing this out. I don't mean to argue with you or or, or carry this on too long. I, I'm, I don't know what more. Uh, how beneficial it would be for, for us to have to file or to make public all of our income tax returns. I do know this, that even with the, what you would describe, I suppose, is relatively limited amount of financial disclosure we have now, it's not, uh, I mean, it's nice in theory, but it's not used awfully well, as you're probably well aware. Once a year, after we file our disclosure forms, the local newspapers go through it, comb through it, and publish, you know, a lot of what they think is interesting personal comment on, on what we, how much money we might have or where we're getting our income from or whatever. Aside from that, nobody ever pays any attention to it. Um, it's, it's just not used. It's not, it's not so useful as one would, would hope it would be. I mean, quite obviously, we've got to be in a position, as I think we are, as I suggested, Jim, that people can tell that we, you know, that we're not, in, we're not investing in something which we have a direct interest in as a member of the legislature. Sure. sure. You know, it, it is used in the campaign process. Well, that too. I'm not and, sure that's all that. Well, what I'm either. saying is that I find that it's used on a pretty regular basis when it comes to uh, uh, election campaigns because different holdings that members have are often criticized by uh, opponents, contributions they receive, as well as their personal investment. investment so. Well, Mr. Trier, could I respond uh, first philosophically and then based on my own experience and our experience in Florida, where we have done this for some time. Uh, first philosophically, perhaps uh, uh, I'm more inclined than some members may be to uh, toward a complete disclosure. I agree with what Jefferson said long ago when he said, a public official becomes a public property. And uh, that's hard for us to take sometimes. We do live completely in a fishbowl, as we're reminded daily in the newspapers. But nevertheless. Very, very open. I'll never forget the day that you stood on a special order and talked about the details of the one or two check problems that you have downstairs. Uh, yes, sir. And I, I believe that uh, we should be open in all respects with uh, all of our finances. I claim no right to privacy where my personal finances are concerned. And I perhaps am a bit. Uh, more inclined toward that view than some members as well. Uh, but from my own experience uh, in terms of making disclosure myself, uh, I recently completed the forms as, as all of us did, and uh, I can compare what I was required to disclose with what I actually disclosed uh, as well through a net worth statement and my income tax returns. And it's possible for my constituents to tell much more about me uh, from the full disclosure that I made. In fact, they can tell that I have no conflicts of interest. More important than my own experience, I think, is our experience in Florida, where we have been mandating by our state constitution this type of full financial disclosure by our elected uh, constitutional officials for 16 years now. And I would say that the best evidence of the worth of this is that uh, we can see over time that, in fact, the vast majority of officials do not profit from their public office. Their net worth does not grow. And uh, my suspicion is that the knowledge that they are going to have to disclose any type of undertaking uh, that they pursue acts as a prophylactic in discouraging them from taking such undertakings.
Well, we, but we, but I want it clear. I want people to understand. People who may be watching that, in fact, we currently are required to disclose any undertaking that we get involved in. That we've got to make known at least the range of, of investment in or that the income correct. from anything and we do, and you get a pretty good idea of it from the and existing law. That is why I said in my statement that progress has been made in recent years. This law was passed in 1978. You don't want to disclose every check we write, do you? I mean, mm -hmm. where do you draw the line? If uh, I, if I would I, be happy to disclose uh, every check that I write. Well, that's if I may say so. I mean, I, I think you're going. What yeah. we propose does not <laughs> to, require to that. anybody for any personal uh, reason. Our you think building, the public has a right to know that? Uh, Yes. What's your net worth? Uh, my, my net worth is about $270,000. Okay. Have you gained or, or lost net worth since you've been here? I've lost. Have you? Well, we all have, so you're showing the... But I've only been here a year. Well, give Our yourself a few years. Give yourself a few years. <laughs> Our bill does not require the disclosure of every check. It discloses... I understand. I'm trying to find out where you would draw the line. That's all. I mean, I think people, even if they are public servants, are entitled to a certain amount of financial privacy. I really and, and do. As I said, I... I, my guess is I'm not in the mainstream of the membership of the Congress on that issue because I would go I'm not sure you're in the mainstream work. of the people back home. I mean, I really don't. I mean, I say to the people back home, I mean, I would, I'd say to people back home, if, if one of the things you, you need to know about me is, uh, or all the checks that I write, don't vote for me. I won't disclose them. I don't believe in disclosing them. I think they understand that I have a right to some privacy. What they're interested in is who I take my campaign money from and who I... Uh, and, and, uh, and what my investments are, what my income is in general, to make sure that there's no conflicts of interest, and I think that's adequate, frankly. And what Mr. Zimmer and I are proposing is, is not that you disclose every check, but that you disclose a net worth statement annually down to the last penny and your tax return. That's what we're proposing. I understand exactly what you're proposing. Uh, right. Mr. Chairman, uh, there is no question that it's a personal imposition to do this. Um, since I first started running for office uh, in uh, 1979, I've disclosed my assets and liabilities to the penny. And I remember uh, two years ago campaigning in front of a supermarket, uh, a, a, a woman came up to me uh, when I, and I introduced myself to her. She said, oh, I know who you are and I know how much you're worth. <laughs> and and I, that didn't make me feel very good and, and my wife doesn't like the imposition uh, on our privacy. Uh, but I think that uh, this, uh, the, the Constitution and our system of, of democracy are built not for the convenience of the representatives, but for the good of, of the people we serve. Well, the country's and done very well for over 200 years without disclosing our income tax data. Well, the, the, the fact is that we went for the better part of 200 years without disclosing much of our, of our campaign uh, finances or any of our personal uh, finances. I, I, we've gone most of the way in the direction of, of full disclosure, and frankly, I think the, the larger dimensions of, of uh, the, our financial lives are already uh, made uh, made public. But this, I believe, is is another step we could go in the uh, we could take uh, to go in the proper direction. And our point is that we, this debate should be held. Our point is that this uh, uh, effort by the Hamilton Gratison resolution should include this debate that well, the four of us are having. I, th now. I think it's I think it is clear that they have within their purview. Uh, within their charge, the ability to do that. It's quite clear that they have a very broad, probably unlimited amount of jurisdiction, and they certainly can if you can prevail upon them. I mean, they the, certainly the, are able to look into these particular The language that we're proposing would make it explicit that amongst the, in addition to organizational reforms, there would be the jurisdiction to consider reforms to uh, increase the, the confidence of the public in the institution. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that You've got to go along with Listen, that. we may start losing the confidence of the public if they see that our net worth goes down every year that we serve here. Well, or, you know, that just, just as perhaps both ways, you know, you know, C SPAN may have, uh, have uh, lowered the confidence of the public in our institution once they saw exactly what we do here. But um, it, that, that's, uh, that comes with the territory, too, I think. Mr. Uh, Dreyer. No? Thank you both very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think our final witness, the Honorable Congressman Peter Hoagland from. Nebraska. Oh, Mr. Chairman, how are you this afternoon? We're fine, thank you very much. I, I we haven't had lunch, but other than that, we're fine. Um, well, I will, uh, I, I will summarize my statement, if I might, Mr. Chairman, and, and do have a copy here for the record. We do, and we, it will be included in its entirety, Pete. Thank you. You're let, welcome. Let me, let me begin by saying what a pleasure it is to appear before this committee in this room, Mr. Chairman, because so much has happened in this room in the course of the history of our country and Congress. So many important decisions have been made that have affected Congress and, of course, affected the nation, and so many 
we've had so many predecessors that have sat on the chair that you're in and, and the other chairs in this room. And I'm not really the chairman, you know, I'm just sort of sitting around here for him. Well, you, you, that's right, but, well, thank you. but, but you're, you're, you're the acting chairman of this right. very important committee. And, and I think looking around this room and, and recognizing how much history has been developed here reminds us of, of all of the good, the good and great things about our institution. And, and it's the only Congress we have, and it is an extraordinary institution, and much of it works well, and we have many, many... You know, members. that's not a bad idea. If we don't like this, there's no reason why we couldn't, couldn't uh, set up another Congress <laughs> if we don't like this one. And this one could continue along the way it is, and the new one can well, you, reform you know, itself. You, you know, Tony, whenever... I, I guess I did, I'm you, sorry. You know, whenever that's suggested... I've been listening to too much testimony today, I'm sorry. From now on, I'll just leave it up to you. No, 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 I, I, think, that's a, I think that's a good comment, because it echoes what I'm hearing back in the district. And I, and I need to remind my constituents that this is the only Congress we have. And, um, and, and, and we need to set about trying to make it work better, not destroying it or replacing it, because that can't be done. Um, I think we have a unique opportunity, of course, for reform now. We're going to have so many new members next year. We'll have a fewer than ordinary percent of people that have a vested interest and more people will be willing to vote for reform. Um, but I think, I think there are a couple of things about this resolution. I'm a co-sponsor and a supporter, but a couple of things that concern me. First of all, events may get ahead of it. It would be nice if you all can, could consider calling on this group to bring some, at least some preliminary results back by October, November. We have been, if, uh, I am interrupting again, but I, I do want the gentleman to know that we, in fact, have been discussing that over the past couple of days. Correct. It's obvious that we do have this, as we've called it, a window of, of opportunity with a large number of new members coming in toward the end of this year, beginning of next. It would be a perfect time for us to get some of these things started if we possibly can before, as you suggest, they have a vested interest in the status quo. That's right, and, and they're going to want to be able to vote on reforms in December, right. so it would be nice to have some thought out. I'm a, member, I'm a member of the Democratic Study Group's Task Force on Reform, and we're, our target is to have some ideas ready to go uh, uh, sooner rather than later. I, I, think, I think it's also important, and Mr. Obi made this point, uh, not to get expectations up terribly high that the hamilton Gratison proposal is going to do everything we want. I look particularly at the provision that no recommendation shall be made by the committee except upon a majority vote of the members representing each house taken separately. Now that means of the four groups, the Republicans and Democrats in both houses, each of the four groups has to be acting in good faith and have to be a group of members that really want to help Congress not obtain partisan advantage. And if any of the four groups just turn this into a quest for partisan advantage, it will fail. Uh, and conceivably, no recommendations will be reported out. Uh, expectations in Congress and outside will have been raised and then dashed. And, and uh, the committee may want to try and look at that provision to see if that can be improved on so, the, so we have chances greater than that provision would suggest of getting some meaningful reform. But let me say, based on my experience here, um, the most important variable are the people that we have in various positions. And I would urge the committee to, to set up as close to a merit selection system of choosing committee and subcommittee chairman as possible. Now, we do have a merit selection system of sorts, based on the assumption that the more experience you have, the more qualified you are. It works in some cases, others it doesn't. But uh, that there's a problem with every kind of system we can think of, but I would hope that the committee will think very, very hard about how to get the very best people available into the most important positions, because I've been members of committee that, that illustrate that very readily. Um, the most obvious need for reform is changing the jurisdictions of the committees to rationalize them, to do away with the duplication. Earlier comments suggested both of you are interested in giving committees exclusive jurisdictions so you don't overlap with four for other committees. Abolish subcommittees to cut down the, the, the number that we have. Clearly we have too many and as Mr. Zimmer indicated, it's been 20 years since the last reform and subcommittees have tended to be generated to accommodate members, not subject matter or jurisdiction. Um, I, I think it would be helpful if the Congress were to devote a greater portion of its time and resources to oversight, because the existing government that we have now ought to consume more than 5% or so of our energies, because the change we're trying to bring about is really only on the edge. By far the most important part of government is what's functioning right now. Um, Mr. Dreyer and I served on the Banking Committee when we had to try to put the pieces back together following the SNL scandal. How much of that could have been avoided with adequate oversight? So I would think that 
that we certainly need to devote more resources to that. A clear agenda setting mechanism. Uh, Mr. Obie suggested the formation of a policy committee to do better planning in terms of, of long range and short range planning in terms of how we should uh, set our agenda. And then finally, we need to do a better job, and I know others have made this point, of, of making our activities, explaining our activity, explaining what people see on C-SPAN, for instance, because it's very, very hard for people watching our proceedings from the outside to really understand how legislative bodies work contributes to the um, unhappiness, I think, with the institution. So anyway, that's a summary, Mr. Chairman, of the basic points that are made in the statement. And I'm Thank you. Thank you, Peter, very much. It's very helpful. And I must say, I agree with virtually everything you said quite strongly. Dave? Let me just say, Peter, that uh, you uh, today have added an important part to the history of this room, uh, as you described it, because I believe that the set of hearings that we've had over the past couple of days are going to play a major role in the proposals that actually end up coming from this committee, which we're going to be establishing. And uh, I might as well just throw out to you what's your thought. You talked about how we'd serve together on the, on the banking committee. What's your second committee? I'm sorry, I don't remember. I'm on interior and judiciary also. You're on interior. So you're on three full committees. Three full so committee. how many subcommittees? Uh, five. The limit of five. I see. What uh, What is your sense about having one major committee, one committee for every member. I think it'd be a great idea, David, particularly if that committee had the sole jurisdiction on that subject matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you serve on three major committees now, Banking, Interior, and Judiciary. Mm -hmm. And uh, your sense is, I mean, our, our experience that we've discussed before about banking, for example, losing a great deal of its responsibility to energy and commerce. So, so your concern would naturally be all of the uh, the battles that go on for jurisdiction. If we ended up with that one committee having it, then you would be uh, happy to give up two of the full committees on which you now serve. Well, vir you know, all, vir virtually all of the bills that I consider th that I'm asked to study and act on and all three committees have been referred to at least one other committee. Mm -hmm. you've, you've faced, um, I know from our discussions, electoral challenges. Uh, <laughs> in the past, unlike a lot of members of Congress. Uh, one of the points made by, uh, by one of the academicians who testified yesterday was that it's necessary for members to serve on two or possibly three full committees to deal with the constituencies at home. Do you feel that that's the case? No, and that, isn't, that has not been my experience. Has it been yours? I don't. No, it hasn't been mine at all. No. Uh, but that, that case was made by one of our witnesses yesterday. Yeah. No, I, the, the reason I've wanted to serve on, on more than one committee is just the exposure and the appetite and the interest mm -hmm. and the, the subject matter those committees have, have afforded. But, but if one thinks about the byproduct of reducing the number of committees on which members would serve, we would get at this challenge which regularly emanates from this side of the aisle about the size of staffs, you know, 30 some thousand staff members on Capitol Hill. And we would naturally see, and, and, and then by virtue of members serving on one major committee, we would see an end to uh, some of these select committees which uh, have gone on. I mean, I served on banking and small business, and I don't know how many people would say the small business committee is going to be my first choice for a committee. I don't think anyone would because no. it's not a major legislative committee. So we would see those responsibilities folded into uh, major committees, therefore creating a, a situation which would address a lot of the concerns that we have here. You know, I'm, I'm really surprised, Tony, to hear as many members, senior members, say that they would be willing to give up a major committee if we could uh, you know, get to the point where members would serve on one committee. We're about the only ones who wouldn't, because we wouldn't have any committees left. That's right. If we gave up our committee, we would be uh, without any committee <laughs> at all. But it's it's very helpful, Peter. And well, David, I certainly agree with what you say. I think I think com com having committees with no legislative jurisdiction, small businesses, largely that kind of the select committees are entirely mm -hmm. that just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I, again, I think the the most obvious. Uh, need for change that all of us immediately recognizes to rationalize the jurisdictions of the committees, bring them up to date. You know, there are most, most committees' jurisdictions are developed case by case, right. they're, and they're anachronisms of a, an economy that was shaped very differently than today. It is obvious that, uh, to me at least, that a number of the select committees established in this Congress are established for political reasons. I mean, they really have no legislative responsibility, 
And uh, it's very tough to vote against the establishment of a committee on children, youth, and families. Um, but excuse me, narcotics. Yeah, narcotics. I mean, you know, the, the you know the everyone wants to address those things, and so you know if you if you cast a vote against that, it means you're against dealing with the drug trafficking problem. You're against children, youth, and families. And I think that that if members are willing, as you have been, and frankly, I'm happy to say the other witnesses who've been before us, Democrats and Republicans, willing to stand up and make that tough choice, decide which committee uh, that they would want to serve on, and then. When we get this 100 and 150 some odd new members, if that became the norm, I think it could greatly enhance the ability of this institution to be more responsive to the American people. And then when we couple with that, a few more open rules so that members could, on the House floor, actually participate in the legislative process in a greater way, I think this, place I think this committee could... No, it'll be get a lot closer to perfect than it is today, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Peter. And, and certainly on the, on the Select Committee on Narcotics, I mean, the narcotics testimony ought to be presented to the Crime and Criminal Justice Subcommittee of Judiciary where the narcotics decisions are made. We're just spinning our wheels to have a narcotics committee without legislative jurisdiction then. We'll pass, we'll pass along a copy of your testimony to Mr. Rangel. Thank you, Pete, very much for coming here. Thank you. The committee is adjourned. <laughs>The National Platform Committee of the Democratic Party met in Cleveland this week for a day-long public hearing. The Platform Committee, which is chaired by Colorado Governor Roy Romer and Representative Nancy Pelosi of California, has been holding these public meetings, gathering opinions and advice from Democrats around the country. The committee will make platform recommendations to the Democratic National Convention in July. C-SPAN 2 will bring you coverage of one of the panels from the platform hearing looking at economic opportunity in America, Saturday night at 8 Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time. From the nation's capital.